tweeting from Tromaville, and I'm here with Tromenda. Hi. Tell us, what, what are we fascinated with? The Horror Squad Podcast. Podcast. This is episode number 303, where tonight we are looking back. It is our basically 300th episode celebration in a lot of ways. We had a busy October, so we weren't really able to fully go into it during episode 300. So we are going to look back at the beginning of this podcast, back when it wasn't the Horror Squad podcast, back when it was uh, something titled Three Guys at Horror. So we are going to go all the way back. And we are going to review three movies back from those days. We are reviewing The Witch. And I already forget the other movies. Cannibal Holocaust. <laughs> and <laughs> Cannibal Cemetery Holocaust. Man. <laughs> and Cemetery Man. All picked by the three of us. So it is going to be a fun episode. A lot of reminiscing. A lot of throwback stuff. Including our very first interview ever conducted by me. Six or seven years ago, very old. I don't even remember what episode that was, Steve. What episode 19. do you know? Do you have that on hand? Episode 19, where I interviewed Mark Corvin, who was the composer for the movie The Witch. I have a very funny story about that. I'll share later on the podcast, towards the end of the podcast, but that, that was an interesting interview. But fair warning, it was the very early days of the podcast, so the audio is a little rough on it but we wanted to kind of pay tribute to those times so you can listen to a very nervous joe conducting his very first interview for that but uh, i'm gonna throw it to steve of course we have steve and todd as always here on the podcast but i'm gonna throw it to steve because i know he has some stuff he wants to talk about yeah absolutely first i hope everyone is enjoying the little easter eggs i'm gonna throw into the episode uh that's kind of like uh to honor all the people who were there way at the beginning but we appreciate new listeners as well so if you're thinking like why did they change the theme song why did they do this why did they do that it's just because it's a little one-time throwback to uh you know the the beginning and early days of this podcast so i thought it'd be cool to just do little different things here and there uh yeah just a couple things i wanted to talk about first one just want to thank everyone who came to our uh monthly movie club we had a lot of fun we watched shadow of the vampire which is a movie about the making of Nosferatu. It's kind of like a fictional take on the making of Nosferatu because it mixes both kind of what it was really like, but also kind of a vampire story at the same time. It's a pretty cool film. Uh, Willem Dafoe as Count Orlock is really uh, is really cool. Like he, he's really good at it. And then you have John Malkovich as the director, and it's just it's a cool film. So if you're able to find it, which isn't easy from my understanding in the US, I definitely recommend checking it out. And this month in November, we're going to do a Christmas film because it's going to be the last day, the last Friday of November. And that one's going to be up for a vote on our Discord. So one of the many reasons why you should join our Discord, you'll be able to vote for the Christmas movie that we watch at the end of this month. And two other little things I want to talk about. Uh, I appeared on another podcast called the Don't Be Crazy podcast, where we reviewed The Exorcist. This was the final episode of their October lineup and I got to go in depth in The Exorcist and the making of it some of the controversies behind it uh, we had some great discussions Zach and I urge you to check it out we had a lot of fun and it was a really a big deep dive on a movie that I personally love so I think it's uh worth checking out and finally I uh, just need to plug my other podcast the one I do with Todd called the Let's XP Geek and Gaming podcast because we had our first interview with the creators of Odd Grove Games, which just really are uh, there in the Kickstarter phase of a new project called Deep Six. And they talk about some personal stories of what I was like in college. And also they tease a little bit of a horror game coming up. So maybe we'll have to have them on this uh, on this podcast as well once that goes through. But for right now, please go check out their Kickstarter. Like I said, Odd Grove Games, Deep Six. It would mean a lot to me personally if you showed them some support. So. Yeah, and uh, Joe, you also have another podcast that you were on, right? That is correct, actually. I was on Salem the Podcast, two local tour guides who started a podcast a while back. Very successful podcast. They're doing really well, so shout out to them. Go check them out. They go over all and 
all things and everything Salem, Massachusetts, whether it be history or current day Salem. They interview a lot of Salem locals, including our friend Bora, the witch, who helped us put on the Hocus Pocus event. But yeah, so I sat down with them and also Bora. Brian Sims was there as well and John Andrews from Creative Collective. The three of us um, sort of went over the Hocus Pocus event and all the behind the scenes stuff, how the event came to be and whatnot. It was a really fun interview. A lot of great sort of stuff that, you know, we weren't able to share, I guess, uh, in depth fully on this podcast. So if you want a great sort of, you know, behind the scenes stuff on everything that had to do with the event and maybe some teasers for next year, definitely give it a listen. It is going to drop this upcoming Tuesday. Just search Sale on the Podcast. They are pretty much anywhere you can listen to podcasts just like us. But yeah, had a lot of fun on that. So thank you to them for the interview. And Todd, how are you doing, buddy? Let's hear your voice, your beautiful voice. How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> no, I can't compete with you guys. You guys are wheeling and dealing, burning and burning. What's he saying? Uh, scary movie, chilling, killing. So uh, yeah, just hanging out. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, I do want one last thing I do want to mention is uh, Living Dead Weekend. We are calling it, I think, the official Horror Squad podcast meetup for this year or for next year. The dates of that June 7th through the 9th, 2024 in at the Monroeville Mall where they filmed uh, Dawn of the Dead, of course. I believe all three of us are planning to be there for that. We are going to be doing a bunch of Romero filming locations. I know they're going to do an official tour. Tickets have not gone on sale for that. But keep an eye on our Discord. We actually have a Living Dead Weekend channel in there. I believe it is private, right, Steve? Invite only. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it's invite only, but anyone's invited. It's just so it doesn't bog down everyone else who doesn't want to hear about it. So all you have to right. do is ask for it and we'll let you in no problem yeah so uh we hope to see a lot of you out there for that it is going to be a very fun weekend once again june 7th through the 9th in uh the monroeville mall which is is that officially pittsburgh pennsylvania is that where Monroe, it's like, Monroeville, right That's, it's yeah, monroeville it's, okay it's actually monroeville pennsylvania. okay so very close to pittsburgh you'd fly into pittsburgh for those of you flying maybe those, we'll go see most... a pittsburgh pirates game all Who right, knows? yeah, sure. That is, yeah, it is the summertime. So, yeah, we're playing. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, once we'll give you more details. I guess once we officially lock down everything, but you can definitely get your hotel. You can check it out. Living Dead Weekends website. Uh, I know the three of us. I think have already locked down hotel rooms and everything for that. So yeah, come and hang out with the squad. How, how far is that from you, Todd? Like, driving, um, I driving. drove it. I drove it once, and it was about five hours. So definitely, definitely easy, easy drive. Yeah, not bad. It's interesting because I'm about seven and a half hours from Joe, but both of us are almost exactly eight hours from Monroeville. <laughs> so just going from just the way the freeways work, I guess. The, yeah, different directions and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh yeah, I can't wait for that weekend. I think it's gonna be friggin' awesome. I, I you know I've never been to Monroeville. It's almost like a a holy land for me. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like some people go to the Vatican. <laughs> me, it was the Monroeville Mall, <laughs> you know, the, one of the, my uh, holy places I always wanted to go to because it's such a iconic piece of, you know, my yeah. horror journey, right? So, yeah, I, I'm psyched. Yeah, the, the con itself I've talked about before is kind of like just average, but the fact that it's at the mall and you can still see like the rock wall, like in one of the scenes where they go out and the zombies are, are, are forming up or like the, the light out in the parking lot. If you're if you're a massive fan as much as Steve and I are in this film, like you're getting to notice all these little details that still exist. The marble wall where David rests his hand at shit like that. It's, it's corny, but it's really fun. Yeah, absolutely. And before we move on, there's one more thing I want to know, Joe, you were at yet another con this past weekend. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what that was like? Yeah. Thank you for the reminder actually, because I completely forgot to mention that. Ah, uh, yeah. Shout out to Rhode Island Comic Con. They gave uh, me a couple of press passes to go and check out their convention. I've been in the past last year. I didn't get to go actually, because I had COVID after our, the Hocus Pocus event and whatnot. So I wasn't able to make it out there, but I was able to go back this year. They do it up, man. They're, they, they, build themselves as the biggest con in the smallest state and they do do it up big it is uh they do it at so it's at a massive convention center but it's attached to an ice arena so they take over both locations by far the biggest convention i've ever been to i don't do a lot of comic 
cons, obviously. I keep it to just horror conventions. So for me, this was like massive, huge. I mean, they have, I think, over 150 guests or something like that. I mean, it's, it is big, big time. Hundreds and hundreds of vendors. Really, really cool time. Uh, really awesome event i gotta say uh, i enjoy going this was my i believe third time going to this one and they definitely do it up uh, i unfortunately had to work all weekend so i had to make it a short trip out there so i wasn't able to check out all the vendors but they have tons of horror vendors as well so uh, for a comic-con i do say they have a really good horror presence had a lot of good horror guests i was able to meet Greg Nicotero, which probably the biggest of the three horror people I met this year. Uh, super nice, down-to-earth guy. Had him sign my my poster project I'm working on and also got an autograph for Steve as well. Uh, he signed Steve's Walking Dead poster, so I was happy to do that for Steve. But super cool guy. We actually talked Savini a lot because I had him sign next to Savini on my poster. So that was a conversation, but that was cool. I also met Seth Green, who act doesn't do a lot of conventions. And so it was cool to see him at one, had him sign an it poster for myself and Steve as well. So that was cool. He was super cool down to earth as well. Very like uh, fan friendly. And then I also met Christina Ricci, which was super cool for me because she was like my childhood, you know, Casper and of course, Wednesday Adams from the original Adams family movies and whatnot so that was a, a treat to meet her and i love yellow jackets it's like one of my favorite shows going on tv right now so she was once again also very cool very down to earth but they had a lot of guests those were the only three i personally met i was going to meet carrie elwes as well but his line was like massive i gotta say there were, it was a saturday i went on saturday the busiest day of course of any convention so his line was huge and whatnot but yeah i mean they had a, a lot of heavy hitters you know that weren't horror wise you know they had um the whole sons of anarchy cast Katie Seagal and Charlie Hunnam, I believe his name is, and all them, as well as Marissa Tomei, Paul Abdul was there. Um, so it's a great con. I mean, they 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 really do it up. They bring in amazing guests and whatnot. So yeah, you can check them out. They're coming back next year, of course. Uh, I think the dates for next year they already announced are November first through the third. Rhode Island Comic Con dot com. If you'd like to attend, so once again, shout out to Rhode Island Comic Con for uh, giving us the press passes to check out their convention. And hopefully I'll be back next year if they give us press passes again. Awesome. So this is going to be a uh, light episode in terms of segments because we have three reviews. So we're not going to do like our usual fair of uh, segments just for this week, but we will have trivia and then the three reviews. And then just a little bit of a look back at the three guys at horror days. Uh, I'm going to ask Todd and Joe a few questions, just uh, reminisce about how, you know, this podcast essentially started in its first iteration, so I'm looking forward to that. But first, it's getting close to uh, the end of the year here, so uh, Toddy boy, what are the points? Oof, well, the points are as follows. So, total score right now, Joe in a commanding lead, and this hurts to say because as a reigning champion, I, I am humble, as we all know, in, in my three three P going on four peat. I am very humble, I never brag, I never complain, anything like that. Joe, 73 in the lead. Steve and I both tied at 68 apiece. Ugh, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Let's go quarter four, which Joe is in the fucking lead still with 10. Steve at nine. Me at a fucking terrible six. Who would like to go today? Who would like to lead it off? I'll lead us off. And I am paying homage, of course. Why not? Since we're going back. <laughs> all oh, three of my trivia questions tonight are going to be from episodes from the beginning I from the three guys <laughs> <laughs> from the three guys days of course so question number one in jason goes to hell how many people did jason possess eight oh eight um one incorrect the correct answer is five he possessed oh, five jason. people fucking jason okay all right no, i thought it was more than that i thought he did like a small run there at the end it's been a while since um, i've seen it so, so i so yeah like I just actually, a quick I, I actually have it listed because i was gonna say if you got it right i was gonna say an extra point if you can name the five people he did yeah, so yeah. he possessed <laughs> the coroner josh yeah. robert campbell officer randy and Diana. Huh. Hmm. 
Okay. Go ahead, Jason. Okay. <laughs> Question number one. And this is from Todd's massive book of trivia questions coming to a store near you in like three years. We'll see. <laughs> what is the name of the detective character played by Johnny Depp in Tusk? Oh, fucking Maurice Bouchard. Incorrect. Uh, is it Guy Lapointe? Like, I swear, if fucking Joe gets his right, I'm going to fucking kill him. What? Is it Guy Lapointe? What was it? Guy Lapointe? Oh, gosh damn it. Motherfucker. Yes. Is it? It's, it's, <laughs> yes. spelled, it's spelled Guy Lapointe. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. give it to you. My, my grandfather's I, name. I, no, I that's, 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 a, that's a right pronunciation. Oh, shit, man. <laughs> my grandfather's name is Guy. <laughs> so. But yeah. you didn't pronounce it the French way, so therefore negative seven points. <laughs> he did. He did. Guy. No, no I, I did pronounce it. Yeah, but right. Lapointe? Isn't it like, would it be like Lapointe? Lapointe? No, he, no, he, he had it right. It's straight All up right. Lapointe. Lapointe. Yeah. Lapointe. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> You know I love my Tusk. <laughs> tusk is amazing. <laughs> all right. So all of mine this week are guess the movie based off the parental guide. Because I thought it was fitting with the three guys days. All right. There is a theme. But if I tell you, it'll make it too easy. So it's for you to figure out. Okay. First one. Sex and nudity. Mm. A drugged woman is penetrated with a dildo off screen. Oh, my. She is. Violence and gore. There are real scenes of animals being killed. Some are killed by humans, while others are animals fighting each other to the death. Cannibal Holocaust? Wrong. That's why I specific, <laughs> spe specified <laughs> off, off screen. Yeah, the other one, because it was okay. on screen. Yeah, I suppose. Right. Alcohol, drugs, and smoking. Members of a cult are forced to consume drugs as part of their rituals. As one does. As one does. Frightening and intense scenes. The scene of two women being assaulted, decapitated, and eaten alive is disturbing because they are screaming and crying for help. This gives the violence and intensity. Okay, wow. And I it. have another guess. So you want to guess, Todd, before Joe gets his second guess? All right, yeah, are we out of clues? Yeah, that's, that was the last one. We're out of clues. Two women attacked, beheaded, animals fighting to the death. And it's real, you said? Uh, yeah. Real. Uh, um, I don't know. Jeff? Wait, did you say real animal death? Yep. Oh. I was going to guess an homage. Of course, the Camel Hawk has Green Inferno, but I can't imagine they would have did real animal uh, killings in that. It's not Green Inferno. Okay. I'm thinking they're cannibal themed this, this week for Steve. Nope, cannibal Nick. Ferox. Wrongs. You guys get up? Uh, yeah. Let me let me try to pull one out of my ass here. Cannibal themed. Is it zomb uh, zombie? Even though it's not cannibals. No. No. So, Joe, you were close. You're on the right track. It's actually eaten mm. alive. The other I film say that, that he did. <laughs> so he made three: Cannibal Ferox, Cannibal Holocaust, and Eaten Alive. He almost got all the cannibals. And uh, <laughs> the the porn star made was in all three of them. The, the main dude. Well, something. Oh, no, uh, no, it's got a very it's American name. John. <laughs> Back to Joseph. Back to me already? All right. Wait, is it right. on a point yet? Oh, yeah, Joe got that one. I did. Yeah. I did. Okay. I'm going to give you a bunch of info on the movie from IMDb. See if you can guess the movie. And remember, this is one we reviewed way back when. <laughs> Seven years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the movie was released in 2003 with an R rating, clocking in at one hour and 31 minutes. We have a cast of Cecile de France, Mywin, Philippe Nahan, Frank Fr or Frank Calfoon, and Andre Finti. Steve's probably, you know, bashing me for my mispronunciations Wrong. here, but, um, um and I, I'm still going. Okay. Okay. Right, you can keep I'm pausing. No, 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 go, 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 go. <laughs> All right. Tagline. Someone is hunting everyone. Switchblade romance. Around her. Incorrect. Which is the okay. alternate title to the film you're thinking about. <laughs> oh, is so it? Technically I'm correct. Yes. I think. What's oh. the other title? I, I, don't know. I gave you the French title for it. That's it's a French film. Wait, right? what, what? What did you say it was? 
I'm not telling you because you're gonna no, translate the, the answer you actually just said. What French film? He, he, you said he the said switch, switch. He's switch, switch blade, blade romance. romance. Yeah. I don't know if that's the alternate alternate title, so I can't say if you're right or not. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll let you know when. Uh, I'll be fair with it. I'll... Okay. But uh, and then finally, maybe possibly the giveaway director Alexander Aha. It's Switchblade Romance, you son of a bitch. I don't know what the, if that's the correct title. <laughs> that's is, the is real that the... title. Google it. Okay. Google but it right what's now. The, what's the actual title? I, it's it's the American title. I forget, but the actual the title is Switch Switchblade Romance. It's uh, it's the one where she's fucking imagining a killer. It's really her. Yes. And she kills her All friend. Right. If that's the. I mean, yeah. I guarantee yeah. that's a that's a real title. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I just can't freaking. I'll, it's fucking. I'll I take. I'll take. I'll take your it. word for it if that's the actual. If that's the well, alternate title. Well, if you, if you tell me, I'll, I'll. I can translate it in my head. So. The American title is high tension. Yep. Which, like, Which in French is haute tension. So not at all. Yeah, Switchblade Switch. romance right there on Google. First thing that pops up. <laughs> AKA right. high tension. Right. Give me that. I should right, get three you. for that. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. yeah. You can't see shit anyway. You can't but... see shit. All right. If I swear, if you get this one, Joe, I'm like, <laughs> just gonna give up. All right. What is the name of the dog that the mall character sent across the street to Andy, who's in the mm, gun store, Christ. in an attempt to bring him food in Dawn of the Dead 2004? Hmm. It's a good question. Hey, 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 hey. Oscar? Incorrect. She is mocked for the name by one of the other characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Beefy? Incorrect. I don't know. I don't remember. We just watched it in like what September? <laughs> yeah. Mr. Mongo. Incorrect. Uh Steve got two guesses if you want to know. I know I I got nothing. The correct answer is chips. Mm. Chips. Chips. I, I wouldn't remember that. All right. Still uh Guess the movie based off the parental guide. Okay. Sex and nudity. Mm-hmm. Brief shot of women's bare breasts lasting about two seconds. All right. Violence and gore. Two men try to choke each other to death and get into a brawl. Jeez. Profanity. There are three uses of fuck, 25 uses of damn, 13 of which are goddamn, 12 uses of shit, Six uses of the bitch, four uses of bastard, three uses of hell, two uses of whore, and one use of dick. Well then. <laughs> Alcohol, drugs, and smoking. There's heavy consumption of liquor and gasoline, and men are shown highly intoxicated. They drink gasoline? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what the hell? Doesn't that kill you? And finally, Sorry. frightening and intense scenes, probably the giveaway. A person morphs into different humans and creatures. Very weird and scary. Hmm. Person morphs into different creatures. And it's a cannibal movie? I didn't say it was a cannibal movie. You said it was a cannibal uh, movie. Oh, son of a bitch. I said I have a theme. Ah, oh, your theme. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, shit. Uh, you guys want a hint? Yes. Sure. I'm not. I'm like 95 percent sure that we reviewed it on the podcast. <laughs> okay. Either one we discussed in depth on what watch, or we actually reviewed. But I think we did review it. Hmm. Can you repeat that last little hint. Yeah. Uh, a person morphs into different humans and creatures. Very weird and scary. Man, sounds familiar. Um, shit. I don't know. A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3? No. No? I got nothing. All right, you guys give up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse. Ah, uh, okay. So I've seen Interesting. That, that bad boy once. We reviewed it, right? Um, We never reviewed it. I don't okay. think we ever did. We talked we, a lot about did. it because yeah. of the year-end show, probably. Yeah, I think okay. so. But I don't, yeah, I don't think we ever did a full episode on it. Okay. Back to me. Three letterbox reviews. Guess the movie. It's gory as hell, chill inducing, and fucking creative. The characters are great. The body count is massive, and the kills are amazing and inventive. This is low budget filmmaking at its best. Number two. 
I can see why audiences were split down the middle on this one. Hmm. And number three, I hate many things about this movie, but mon- none more than that I watched it. I guess the real clown was me. Terrifier 2. Incorrect. Fuck me. Oh, um, Terrifier? Correct. Yes. <laughs> Damn it, you, <laughs> you dirty thief. Terrifier 2 we did on the Horror Squad. Horror squad. But Terrifier right. we did back in the day. Gotcha. Okay. Name the three actors that have starred as a main character in all three versions of I Am Legend. Okay, I got it. Charlton Heston. Okay. Vincent Price. Yeah. And Will Smith. Correct. Good job. Correct. Very nice. Very good. Very good. I prefer the Vincent Price version for the record. Uh, I'd agree. I'd agree. All right. Final one. Remember my theme. I don't even know what your theme is. Did we figure out your theme? No. <laughs> no, 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 no I don't no, think we right. have. All well, right. let's see. His first one was Cannibal uh, Cannibal Movie. His second one was... I don't even remember second one. Uh, <laughs> the Lighthouse. <laughs> the Lighthouse. The Lighthouse. Okay. Uh, so I'm assuming... Well, no, because we didn't, never did Eat Alive. The theme is movies. Yes, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Sex and nudity. Yep. A female zombie's naked butt is shown for about 20 seconds. Nice. Violence and gore. Various zombies are decapitated, but their insides are a black and a black smokish substance pours out. Mm. Profanity. 26 uses of the F word and other swears. Alcohol, drugs, and smoking. None. Oh. Pretty rare for a movie. (laughs) For a horror movie. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, frightening and intense scenes. Every single character dies at the end. The only one who survives what is there? Tom Waits' Hermit Bob. Tom Waits what? T- uh, Tom Waits' Hermit Bob. What does that mean? Who the hell is I know Tom, Tom Waits? Tom Waits is. <laughs> but I can't think of what movies he's been in. What, what, what big movie is Tom Waits in so I can put the picture? This one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I think he's more for music, isn't he? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I know he does cons because I've seen him at him, <laughs> but I can't. But I can't remember what movie he's there for. Decapitations, smoky bodies. That one I feel like should be the giveaway, right? Yeah. Like black smoke yeah. coming out of a zombie body, and everyone dies at the end. And a girl's butt. Twenty seconds. Yep. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I got no enough. You guys go up? Yes. Yep. If I knew so, Tom Waits was, maybe. So this was a movie that you guys reviewed right after the split off for the three guys at horror. It is Ma. The Dead Don't Die. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hated that. We hated <laughs> that one. So we hated awful. that. That was like a scathing review. I Oof. remember that one. <laughs> I still don't know who Tom Waits is, though. Let me, let me look at his face real quick. <laughs> I still don't know who that is. I'm looking right <laughs> at him. American musician, he, composer, He's a musician, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, whatever. That movie went off the rails, man. It sucked, <laughs> dude. <laughs> All right, quarter number four. Steve with the big night with two. Joe one, myself one, which brings us to a two-way tie with Steve and Joe 11 apiece, myself seven. I'm not going to tally up the end of the year one right now. I'm going to let you guys What wait. was your theme, Steve, by the way? It was uh, one related to each movie you were watching. So we had Eaten Alive, uh, okay. which was a cannibal film. We had uh, one trickster. Robert Eggers, and when we had one zombie film. Well, all right. You're a little trickster, it. aren't you? <laughs> he is. Little motherfucker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> have, you guys, right. have you guys seen Eaten Alive? I don't uh, think so. No, it's been in my TV for like yeah, it's it's, like it's a it's fucking it's a fucking rough one. <laughs> like, yeah, like it's like it's, well, it's like real. Cannibal Holocaust. It's yeah. yeah, it's 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 a tough one to watch. Killing killing animals too. Like it's a lot. It's, yeah, less of the animal. There's a little bit less of it though, but there's a lot of like rapey. Yeah. Like, that yeah, which not I'm not good. a fan of. But anyway, we'll talk it's about just... during Cannibal Holocaust. All right, so we're gonna lead off with our films here. First one is my pick, Cannibal Holocaust from 1980, directed by Mister. Reguero de Tatao, something like that. <laughs> can, a, can a movie go too far? 
A New York University professor returns from a rescue mission to the Amazon rainforest with the footage shot by a lost team of documentarians who are making a film about the area's local cannibal tribes. This one is one I've seen three or four times at least. And uh, thankfully, Grindhouse Releasing put out a really good Blu-ray that's a double disc and blah, blah, blah. has like a bunch of cool stuff in it. But most importantly, it has an option of to not watch the animal killing, which... We can talk about more depth later, but I don't need to see that stuff. So thankfully, click that button. So I never saw any animal deaths. It wasn't even implied. So, and you know, it doesn't even take away from the film at all because those are fucking stupid to be in there in the first place. But right away, we're hit with like an amazing, soothing, uh, melodramatic score that I absolutely love. And the intention for the filmmaker was to have like this really, you know, soothing score to the film to offset the brutal violence that you were witnessing from scene to scene. So I really appreciate that as well. But essentially, there's a group of younger film students or something like that, documentarians, they, they want to be famous, right? So they go to the Amazon because they want to like see the natives, quote unquote, and see how savage they are and things like that. But they're fucking full of shit, right? So they get go uh, they go missing. And a more advanced crew with like, you know, preparations, things like that, goes to the rainforest to find them. And the film is about the advanced group uh, going to the, uh, the forest and eventually finding out what happened to our crew finding their lost footage, bringing it back to New York City, where they watch it for a potential news broadcast about like, you know, making up documentary footage with these kids getting killed, things like that. So we watched the the footage essentially with the potential filmmakers and the news crew to see what actually happened to them. And we learned a lot of bad stuff, not only about the the natives treatment of these kids, but also the treatment by the natives from these kids and vice versa, right? So they're both abusing each other. And you know what? These kids are fucking assholes. And we'll talk about that later. But yeah, it's a hard-hitting film. It's not easy to watch, especially if you left, you left that uh, animal death on. And there's a lot of other stuff that you're going to see in here. A lot of brutal rape, rape with foreign objects, assaults, killing indiscriminately for no reason. And it also has a realistic factor to it most of the time. There are some aspects where you see, like, you know, one of the natives that aren't actors, clearly, you know, obviously. Um, they're smiling in the background, things like that, goofing off. But other than that, very hard to watch, brutal, but also a really solid film with which has a message to it i think some people tend to miss so what do you guys think about it yeah so this is um probably like my third time i've ever seen the movie first time i saw it was like in high school when i was just really looking for sort of shocking and fucked up movies the second time was when we did it for this podcast originally and then this is my third time watching it overall like i think it's right i guess groundbreaking for its time but I think there's like just a lot of like unnecessary stuff in here that's just shock to be shock. Obviously, the animal killings being the number one thing. There's really no need for it in this movie. It doesn't progress the movie like really in any did way. Did you watch it this add... time? I did. I, I watched it with the animal killings, which they're they're upsetting, but they don't like to me. They don't look like real enough. Like I just I guess I took my mind out of it to make it to make me think like it was fake and not real but when you really think about it it's disturbing like to see these poor animals killed just for the sake of the movie although i did hear that you know they were fed to the tribes people after the fact or something so i guess at least they weren't killed in complete vain but yeah i mean it doesn't add anything to the story it's just there for pure shock value so it's just really unnecessary so i could i could see why like they did uh in the future viewings like to just take it out because there's no need for it at all i also think there is like a lot of just like i i don't know like to me it my issue with the movie is is that most of it's just pure shock value right like you know the the why did these why did they go into the forest to just completely fuck with these tribes people? I mean, I assume it's the director was kind of going for, well, really, like, we're, you know, us as civilized people are just really, if not more, uncivilized as some of these tribes people, which is, you know, is an interesting thing to think about and go into. But, like, I just don't, I just didn't get, like, why they went there to just fuck with them you know and like i yeah so that like i just took issue with that because i was like well like i feel like there should have been like a reason right behind that like instead like we're just thrown into it and they're just immediately just you know raping these tribes women and just killing them for for no fucking reason whatsoever i just wish we got like more of a backstory as to why 
they were doing this but like technically i think it's like a really like well done movie like the practical effects are uh, amazing and still to this day look pretty realistic for a movie that was made in 1980 so i mean it's a mixed bag for me is it something like i necessarily will like feel the need to watch over and over again no but like it really was groundbreaking for its time because it really was sort of the first you know mockumentary found footage style movie of this caliber so i mean i i i respect it in some ways and in other ways i i don't respect it yeah it's also my third time watching it i think i saw it uh, so when i worked in the uh the sex shop one of the customers like ha- like slid me this cd <laughs> and he's like because we used to watch we used to talk like horror all the time when he'd like check out and he's like dude you gotta watch this one this one's really fucking sick so i want that's how i got to see it the first time and i watched it like two years ago because i was just uh, i hadn't watched it in a long time and i was just curious i heard someone talk about it so i thought after that last watch that this would be hopefully my last time but here we are again this movie like joe i'm like conflicted on this movie on one side it's brilliant the music is fantastic it was so ahead of its time you know both in the found footage kind of aspect of it but also he kind of predicted what like youtubers were like you know in 1980 like people going to a place where they don't belong and fucking around just to get views you know that's kind of like what they're doing right they're they're trying to bid for in their cases to make a documentary and make it look like it's serious but in reality they're actually like making you know the the situation a lot worse and creating issues so it looks worse on on screen so it's it's a really brilliant film and it's it's so real looking that i mean as someone who watches horror like year round all the time it even made me uncomfortable at how real some of the scenes looked you know and i know the animal stuff is real and unfortunately i don't have the non-animal cut so i have to watch that stuff but it's it's really a mix of that the raping which i really don't like to watch in movies the assault the children that are in the scenes you know it's just there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't vibe with me at all and but at the same time i respect this movie so much for what it did you know fooling people to the point of getting a murder to like uh, accusation by the government thinking that he had actually murdered the crew to make this movie in real life it's it's a wild film and there are a few things i want to discuss specifically but i'm definitely conflicted but i definitely i also respect it in a in a weird way yeah, so so Alan Yates, there's kind of a throwaway line there where the the filmmaking crew is talking about Alan, who's like the main guy or whatever, that he orchestrates his films, right? So he pushes people because when they show him like his test reel, they're like, oh, fuck, he was really recording people being assassinated and executed. He's like, no, like he orchestrated all this. It's not real. So 100% the movie is na- naive people thinking, and the theme is, you know, we'll call them, they're Americans, right? So American Westerners, whatever, thinking they're so superior than someone else that they can do whatever they want and exploit whoever they want, which is exactly to Steve's point with YouTubers. You have people going to suicide force looking for dead bodies and they pretending that they're shocked when that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted to run into a dead body and now they want to pretend that they're caring about these people. Absolutely not. And it goes hand in hand too when Alan comes across a person that is um, impaled through the vagina out of her mouth. And he's smiling, and then the cameraman is like, "Hey, Alan, be careful, we're recording." And then he like instantly shuts it off and starts saying, "Oh my God, like how can they be so barbaric?" But in his mind, he's like, "Fuck yeah, I got this great footage that he didn't have to orchestrate because we know when when he goes to the when they go to the um the the tribe whatever he burns everything just so he can get the reactions of people like in peril, right? So 100% Western culture thinking that they're so far above somebody else that they can exploit how they live and then two is fuck around and find out right like you go to these people like they don't care if you're blonde hair blue eyes or whatever it is like you're in, encroaching on their territory their way of life their tribe whatever they're gonna fucking kill your ass and eat you and exactly what they do punctuated with the the ultra violence that we see which i agree a lot of it is unsettling but a lot of it too if you look at it with a critical eye kind of looks goofy like when they're sawing people open and they're just a bunch of pushing a bunch of blood around but we have that bad stuff mixed with like is that a real fucking dead body it's like they're chopping people up you're like holy shit like if they went this far 
who knows if they didn't pay someone to kill a tribesman in this for real in this movie you know what i mean so i, I get why people don't like it and th this isn't a movie that i find pleasure in it's not something that i can put on like a you know friday 13th and have fun with it this movie is not fun at all but every time i watch it it leaves me thinking about it for a couple of days afterwards uh, regardless of that that score being in my head it makes me think of just the the brutality of the film and like the way People are fucking so stupid today with like what Steve mentioned with YouTube and how this was pretty much the same thing just, you know, 40 years ago, whatever it is. I love the contrast of the two approaches from the two like documentary crews. So you have the ones who respect the tribes and respect their culture and respect like, you know, kind of uh, their relationship with nature. And, you know, they, they just respect the fact that okay these are the things that this culture does we're not going to mess with it even if for american culture that's not something we would do at all you know and i, I really like that approach and then you have the second half of the movie which is the total opposite right where it's uh it's our way and we just fuck with these people because we're obviously superior to them because we have better technology and better weapons and stuff like that so i really like kind of to see that contrast and i actually prefer i i know the second part is like more the horror part even though there's some horrific stuff in the first half, but I really like seeing the culture of those two tribes that we see because it is so vastly different from what we're used to, you know? It's so disgusting to us, but to them, it's like a normal part of life. And I'm not just talking about the killing and the raping and stuff like that. I'm also talking about like, the old ladies who are chewing the food, like pre-chewing the food for everybody and then spitting it into a bowl and then giving it as like some delicacy, like it's a big deal that they're getting access to that food at one point they're fed like human being you know it's funny because he the main guy he gets the trust of the tribe and then the other guy who like knows the tribe more he's like oh congratulations you got us invite us for dinner he's like wait what <laughs> and then he realizes he has to eat human you know well talk and... about how he got that trust so oh yeah so <laughs> <laughs> it, it's by so he was playing was it like chanting on his radio i guess i i kind of missed what that chanting was from was it well, from I, the I, I meant a couple before that when he got fully nude and oh my god and i got a and got a tug from one of the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the girls in the tribe which i don't think was planned like i i there's Absolutely no way not to, like, it wasn't no yeah but apparently <laughs> they hired uh women from a local brothel and i guess they thought that he was there well he is a porn star right that guy so i guess they thought he was uh he was there for pleasure, but you just wanted to bathe in the movie. So that was funny. It was uh, but also a little disturbing at the same time. It's just, you know, the nature of it. A lot of people get naked as they're planning this. Miguel, to get the uh, the oh, tribe gosh. to, like, trust them, also gets fully naked and just, like, running at them as they're throwing blow darts at them. It's, mm -hmm. I guess, nudity is a big deal in their, in their culture. Yeah, they want to see Dong, man. <laughs> you get plenty of that in this movie. Yeah, and you also get disturbing nudity too, like little girls, and you're like, eh. But it's it's showed as like, like native. National Geographic, yeah, yeah like exactly. Like, like it's not, it's not sexual oh, nature. It's not the right, yeah, sexual nature. I guess is the right term. Just showing them how they are. But uh, I got a I got a comment too. Like, that's got to be the smelliest sex of all time, when Alan and his girlfriend are banging. And I'm like, that's fucking gross, man. Because they're like in the Amazon literally walking around sweating all day and they're he's raw dogging i'm like oh it's fucking yuck so the weird thing about this film though is like alan and crew want to be famous right this is the whole reason of making like a really cool look at what we're seeing documentary but then they record themselves raping people like are they are they recording that for their own personal pleasure because they're not going to keep that in the film i think so because there's a scene early in their part of the story where they're just like changing you know in like mm. before they get there and they film the girl naked and stuff and that's it's true. it's just showing them kind of fucking around and having fun and that's where i think it that was to show that they're also filming stuff like on the side for themselves kind of which is weird like uh, someone who studied film to burn footage like that especially when you don't have ac easy access to get more is like such a waste to me but yeah you know, that, that's no. their deal right that's a great point too and I, I got a comment on their how just stupid they are. They have every opportunity to leave, right? Their guide gets snake bitten. You know, they cut off his leg, which is gratuitous. There's no like, would you really do that? <laughs> cut off his leg instantly? It's like I a zombie's bite on his leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they lose their guide. 
So they're like, should we turn around? Nah, we'll be fine. We're in the fucking middle of Amazon. We're good. We have all the experience we need. And then um, they're attacked. Should we leave? Now nah, let's keep recording. And it, it answers the question of that we always bring up when it's um, like, you know, found footage movie. Like, why are the characters still recording? Why? Is it so? Why are these characters still recording? Is it for the drama? Because Alan is literally recording his girlfriend getting fucking beaten to death right before the camera falls and turns on him and he's dead. Like, what is the point? Is it for the movie's sake? Or, I, I know it's because of the movie, but what do you think the characters' motivations for continuing to record when they shouldn't? I don't think there is one, right? I think that is like something to think about, I guess, when watching this movie. There's definitely a moment where the cameras like should be put down, but yeah, I mean, it's 1980, there was really no nothing like it at the time so i think it's a little more forgivable back then also i guess they're filming documentary or something but i don't know at some point like you you know you're filming your girlfriend being murdered I, it, it seems a little far-fetched but, but they do establish that he's kind of a psycho and he's also the last one to stay alive so it is plausible that in his mind he's still gonna get away and this is gonna be like his you know, his big moment, because if he does escape with that footage in his mind, this is like, this is his Pulitzer, you know, this is his, yeah, that's true. his big master piece, piece of art. So I could see that character, especially filming right essentially to the end. So what, there's a lot of gore in this, like a lot. What scene stands out the most to you as like kind of the toughest to watch? Well, I, I I didn't watch it this time, like I said, for animal stuff, but the scene where they stab the rodent looking creature, that that is always replayed in my mind. Like every time I think about this film, like it's it's like traumatized is the wrong word, but you know, like etched into your brain, like so fucked up. Like fuck him for doing that. But as far as like human violence, I gotta say, like and it's not I don't take any pleasure in the scene. It's fucking brutal when he's assaulting the the native with the wooden penis. That's just like that's fucking awful. Yeah. That, that was actually uh, uh, a white yeah. woman. Eh? <laughs> that wasn't even a native. It's no, uh, it apparently they couldn't get someone for that. So they huh. used the, uh, the, like the set dresser or something like oh one on the crew because you know, that's how I read wow. in, uh, in the trivia. <laughs> well then. Yeah. I mean, the animal killing stuff obviously is the worst you know and i won't even go into details about stuff that i found disturbing with that but that is definitely the worst part of the movie as far as like gore parts that i thought were pretty cool and realistic i guess um i liked when they towards the end when they're just fucking beating them with the uh their sticks and they just start like coming apart and stuff that there was some pretty gnarly gore in that part that i found to be pretty you know i was kind of sickly smiling being like oh shit that's pretty gnarly you know and then yeah i mean that's like enjoyable gore but there's like a lot of real like todd said just disturbing shit that you, you don't even want to watch or or see yeah i mean animal stuff aside because that was obviously knowing that it was real going in is always like makes it more difficult to watch the one that really like kind of ugh, was the turtle scene, but I won't go into detail as to what happens there. The one scene, though, from like the kind of quote unquote fake gore in uh, this movie that really disturbed me is when they cut the baby out of the womb of a wom of a woman, and then like kill the baby and then kill the woman. Just which looks real. It, it, the whole thing looks. This movie is so realistic that it made me uncomfortable for the entire. You know, hour forty minutes that this movie runs, and it's uh, you know, I watch so many movies, and not a lot of movies do that. This is one of the few, and I just, yeah, he did a great job of making it look real. Like I didn't get that feeling from Green Inferno; that seemed more fake to me. You know, whereas this just had such a maybe it's because of the kind of late seventies, early eighties style of it, or the documentary feel. I, I don't know what it is, but man, he whoever did the gore in that film should have an oscar because you know obviously he wouldn't because it was too gross but the, it looked that real it was just so well done any other final thoughts uh no i mean i i don't have anything really for one mystery trivia point can you name the film the title of the film that they suggested their porn in the jungle should be called oh man oh. i don't remember they're like we can call it the jungle jollies baby no, nice. <laughs> I was gonna say rumble in the jungle, maybe. 
All right, I'll, I'll start off with uh, with rating it then. You know, to paraphrase, it's a brutal film. It's hard to watch. I highly recommend the non-animal killing because when you when you get to those scenes, you can't think about anything else. I, 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 I mean, I think I speak for all of us. Like, when you see that, you're like, this is fucked up. And you just, like, hone in on that aspect and you can't really appreciate anything else. So having seen both versions of the film, I think the far superior one is the animal stuff removed because they don't even hint at it. You know what I mean? Like they might point a gun, they point the gun at the pig, but that's it. They don't even talk about it, killing them and stuff like that. So I think the far superior film is this rated version because you get to focus on the stuff that I mentioned, like the stupid bullshit, college kids going in there and not knowing a damn thing, the brutality of it all, the, just the waste of life. And for that reason, plus the score, which is fucking amazing, I give this one a four out of five. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the animal killings take away what is actually a pretty good movie, you know, because I agree, like when they're on screen, like that's all you're thinking about. And then you think about it for a few minutes after the fact. And it does take away from what I think is actually a really technically well made and very well done movie. It's just so raw and feels so authentic that you really do feel like you're watching something you shouldn't be watching. And that says a lot to the director so you know big props to him i mean the dude fucking literally had to go to court and prove that he didn't murder these people which is absolutely stunning that that could happen even in the 1980s so i i mean i respect the hell out of this movie like i said in a lot of ways but the animal killings are just to me unforgivable in a lot of ways so i agree watch it with the edited version with all the animal killings because it adds absolutely nothing to the movie. It doesn't progress the movie in any way. But um, I, I do respect this movie despite its faults. Um, I give it a three and a half out of five. Yeah, I'm kind of the same length, like wavelength there. You know, I, I respect the movie a lot. It was way ahead of its time. It revolutionized certain parts of horror, you know, with found footage and all that. I mean, he went to great depth to make this movie seem real at the time he even had it in the actor's contract that they needed to disappear for a year and it's not until the court case against him that he had to find them from their exile and get them back into the forefront of uh of media to prove that they were actually alive so that's that's crazy that you can fool like a court system to think that you know your thing's actually real so kudos to the filmmaker on a really well done movie but at the same time it's so friggin' disturbing and i have a really hard time watching it so i get the same score as joe i get three and a half out of five i gotta i gotta say one final note here and it's having to do with the video nasty list you know that were you know banned films in england a lot of those films on there or at least a good a good portion of them are, are films that i think we all agree that, like are stupid to be on that list like you get a couple e evil dead <laughs> yeah you get a couple deaths that are like yeah brutal but comic or you know or comedic or just yeah. clearly effects kind of a holocaust well deserved to be on this list if you're gonna ban any movie it's right. kind of a holocaust you know so i don't know where i'm going with this point but <laughs> i thought it was the one that's well deserving of a video nasty list although i don't think that list should exist but you know what i mean yeah no absolutely yeah that is, video nasty list should have just been a warning like these are the most fucked up films out there just be careful you know don't don't watch them lightly that's all that yeah. video nasty list should have been it shouldn't have been a ban I, i'm yes. not a fan of banning things you know just warn people let them know and make them make their own decision right all right movie number two so this is the movie that i had my first appearance on on three guys at horror and it is an italian film by the name of della morte della more aka Cemetery Man from 1994. So this movie is directed by Michelle Suavi, and it stars Rupert Everett, Francois Haji Lazaro, and Anna Falci. It's the story of a cemetery man who must kill the dead a second time when they become zombies after seven days from being dead. So it's basically a guy who he runs a cemetery. His name's Francesco della Morte, and he's got his like little assistant uh, Nyagi, and they basically yeah. have to make sure that the cemetery is taken care of. But part of that job is also that the dead come back to life at, on the seventh day. So he has to kill them a second time, rebury them and make the public think that, you know, nothing has ever happened. But during uh, his time there, he meets a woman and he falls in love with her. And that leads the story into a really wild <laughs> uh, adventure that 
honestly no one can see coming you know it's just so random at times that i don't know how anyone could guess what would be coming next uh this is my second time watching it i watched the first time when i did that episode which was episode 11 of the three guys at horror and you know i'm gonna say that i feel that my i like my score of this movie has changed from six years ago i actually re-listened to that episode just to see what my thoughts were and i'm very eager to talk about certain things that we didn't talk about way back then that i don't know why we didn't talk about the review was very short surprisingly back then it was like maybe 10 minutes it was surprisingly short so i'm curious what you guys think of certain things but personally i think it there's a lot of real cool stuff in if in it great imagery there's some highly memorable scenes and there's a lot that i like about it but i also find it loses steam in the second half and by like the three quarters of it i'm like okay there's it needs to end but at this point there's not much going on anymore there's story beats that are repeating in a weird way i don't really understand why which we'll talk about and um i still came out like i still had fun watching it but i think i'm a little lower on it than i was six years ago yeah this is also my second time watching it uh since we first reviewed it and i didn't remember anything about this movie really at all so it was pretty much uh, a fresh watch to me I mean, this movie's fucking weird, man. It's it's really, really weird. It, but it's unique. I'll give it that. Like it is, it is a very unique movie in a lot of ways. I I got a lot of uh, brain dead, dead alive, dead alive slash dead alive vibes watching this movie because like tonally, it's just like sort of weird, like just so bizarre. But like I found it like pretty entertaining for the most part. Like. The zombies are really cool and it's different, like how they kind of come al- alive after like whatever, seven days or whatever. And him and, you know, his caretaker Nagi there, they have like a really fun, fun, like back and forth thing going on. I mean, this movie's like really horny too. Like it has like this really like horny undertones throughout. Maybe, I mean, maybe the some of the best breasts put to screen ever in this movie too i gotta say very impressive actually i and i say that because i actually read on the imdb that it was like voted maybe the best breasts in a horror movie ever and i i may agree with that but man like i I don't know like i agree with steve in a lot of ways too like it 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 gets a little too off the walls towards the end of this movie and it, it starts to lose me a little bit especially when like the same actress keeps coming back over and over again and like immediately like falls in love i i I honestly i don't know what the director is go was going for in a lot of ways here like and especially which when we get to the ending i found it extremely confusing and i i want to and i kind of want to hear what your guys's thoughts are on like i guess what sort of the metaphors i guess the director was going for in a lot of ways with this movie i don't fully understand it but did I have an entertaining entertaining time watching it? Yeah. All right. So this was a film that I tracked down, like at the turning point when I became like a really hardcore horror fan. I, uh, you know, I started with zombie films and tracked down all of them I could. So I remember distinctly getting this DVD from Suncoast Video, which is now closed like every other video store and just devouring it. And I love this film. I still love it today. But I also agree with you guys, and I have an exact point where this movie kind of like goes from, oh, this is fucking cool to like, uh, really? Like, can we just stop? And uh, we'll just discuss a little bit later. But the zombies are fucking cool, man. I love the zombies. The cemetery, which was, you know, built on top of a real cemetery, which I find really cool, is amazing. Like the lighting, the the ghostly effects, even though you see some microfilament, you know, who gives a shit? Whatever. This is 94? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's some a couple technical problems. But I really don't care. Um, the town is really cool. There's like a dreamlike quality of this film, which I think connects to the very ending that I really like. And uh, I just like it. The premise is really cool of a dude just hanging out in the cemetery with his, I guess, special needs assistant, which also adds to the very end of the film. Like what's going on with that and just taking care of the zombies. And no one really wants to uh, recognize his efforts because they just want to sweep this whole undead coming back from the death or undead coming back to life and just sweep under the rug. But like I said, there's a, a, a flip in this where as soon as that, that switch is flipped, this movie fucking goes negative, like downhill really fast. So I don't know. What do you, what do you guys want to start from here? Yeah. I'll talk about the stuff I liked first. 
you know, and then we can go into some of the stuff that I think, and because I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what point of the movie the you know movie kind of uh, takes a turn. I really liked the zombies, or they call them returners in this movie. I really liked their look. They're all unique looking. They had like even a little bit of a personality, even though they're dead. You really got some interesting things out of the zombies. Like you never knew what to expect with them because they're not just regular zombies. They're not just like mindless people going to bite. Like they're they have like they do these little actions like there's one on a motorcycle randomly and Claudio don't leave me you know there's one that's just a head for a while that that walks in a weird way so there's just a lot of fucking random stuff with the zombies so every time a different zombie would come on screen I would be kind of interested to see okay what are they going to do with this one you know like what's going to be the angle with this one is it just going to be him is it going to be another fucking full group of uh, boy scouts or whatever the case may be the zombies in this were fun as hell and all the scenes that they're in i thought brought up the movie considerably you know even some of the weirder shit like the blue orbs that are around from time to time that make no sense and don't come back later in the film i I just thought it added to the ambiance of the amazing location as well like you said the cemetery is just so cool and gothic and creepy and unique looking i yeah i love the whole aesthetic of the film yeah there's some subtle stuff in here too that i I really like like her husband's picture changing subtly like when they're kissing like and when he uh she describes him as like an excellent lover it goes from like scowling to smiling Naji or whatever his name is when he's cooking like the most disgusting fucking food but his appetite is ruined because his partner is having sex in the other room like really he's putting like all sorts of shit on this on this thing there's a lot of stuff in here that um is really funny too like i think i forget if it was a mayor or someone but we cut to him and he has his hand on the breast of a statue and he quickly pulls it away and looks embarrassed so there's a bunch of little stuff in here that i really appreciate along with like like the gore is awesome, zombies are awesome, but also like the little stuff they throw in was cool too. Agreed, and I I think Rupert Everett, our cemetery man, just he gives such he really gives it his all. Like in this movie, you know, you could tell like he he really like took it seriously, didn't like try to go too campy with it or whatever. Although there are very campy moments, but I feel like he played it pretty straight, and I think it works like so well here for him. He's someone I would love to meet at a con. If I don't think he's ever done one, like ever, but he is totally someone. If they ever could get him for one, that would be really good. And R.I.P. Nagi just died this year. Actually, I oh, looked I him up on IMDb. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So th- there's one issue with Nagi though that I it's tough to overlook. So he has this uh, on the outside, uh, sweet like relationship, I guess you could say, with the mayor's daughter, where he like kind of lusts after her and stuff like that and then she dies and he really wants to take care of her so he you know digs her up before like just as her seven days are up so you know her body's gonna come back and then he takes her head and brings it into his like inside a broken tv in his apartment and he makes out with the head and they're in love and they want to marry each other and it's like it's all sweet and stuff but then you when you see her tombstone you're like oh fuck she's fucking 14 or 13 like goddamn Nyagi. like what the hell are you doing yeah Yeah, it it, it occurred to me this time i I don't remember that last time but i was like we see her tombstone we're we're gonna know how old she is i hope she's at least 18 but no she's like 13 or 14 so i'm like god damn dude why i didn't know why did they have to do that you know i didn't notice that either that does make it a little more disturbing yeah now thankfully there's no body to you know corrupt uh because he beheads her but still, it's just, it's a disturbing detail that I thought, why why do these movies get, like, I, I've ruined Indiana Jones this year for the same reason. Now I'm ruining Cemetery Man. I gotta stop, like, fucking reading into things because it's a, yeah. it's a disturbing I mean, place. It, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to get right, though, now. Yeah. You know, like, not, yeah, yeah. not yeah, having yeah. stuff like this, because it's not, it's not right, regardless yeah. of what year it came out. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. yeah what do you, how do you guys feel about, like, I love the, what's it called? The bone room that they have they bang oh, the first. ossery yeah it's so cool and it's yeah. real which is disturbing what do you guys feel about like the twist that like he didn't kill her like he well he didn't kill the zombie he actually killed her right and they could have been together yeah i thought that was cool like it i i don't think it was like explained that well though you know like i feel like it was kind of like a like a tidbit that's kind of thrown in rather than like this super revealing like moment i think it should have went bigger right like i feel like that should have been like an even bigger reveal than what it's kind of 
like an afterthought and is kind of thrown in there. So I think it would have made an even bigger impact had had they kind of did something more with it. No, I agree. But I'm I'm so confused as to what the story is with with the girl because like you said Joe before she keeps coming back in the like the same body but other people's minds but they always fall in love with him but there's a caveat including one that's really weird that I really don't understand so what's the deal with this girl and why does she keep coming back and why does she have these weird like you know quirks yeah so that that's where the movie really drops off for me is when he sees her as the um, secretary to the new mayor and she tells him literally that she's afraid of erections or like guys, you know, boners. So he literally goes to a fucking doctor to get his penis injected with something to not to give him so he can't have sex. And then the next scene, she comes over and is like, the mayor raped me, but then I wanted to do it again. So we did it again. And now I like uh, penises. And he's like, well, I don't know if I can get it up. And then two minutes later, that wasn't a problem because they had sex i'm like what is going on that's like that and then the prostitute and he goes on rampages or does he and and then his friend that we briefly met earlier is like a copycat killer it's like what is like where are we going yeah agreed that's definitely when the movie especially like the whole rape thing which is like the mayor raped me but then like I sympathized with them or something. So we had sex again or something. And then I felt like that whole, that's so bizarre and just really like does, it didn't fit with the rest of the movie in a lot of ways. I feel like, cause like the rest of the movie is like about love and romanticizing and stuff. But then that line is just thrown in there so bizarrely. And now like after finding out that the other girl was 14, like it really starts to become kind of unsettling like that the director is putting this stuff in there like now that i'm seeing this so yeah that that's kind of throwing me off a little bit now yeah just it didn't make sense to me and then yeah the movie just continuously goes off the roll the rails after that like you said with the whole erection thing and him wanting to cut off his dick at one point and stuff yeah it it definitely agree starts to lose me um a lot there before that i think it's like a really fun time but now we're heading into like just really sort of uh, nonsensical uh, territory with this movie. Yeah, because so he starts killing off everybody in town, right? But the detective keeps saying, now nah, you're good. It's not you. And it's just like, what's going on? <laughs> like, I don't understand. At one point, I thought maybe he was the Grim Reaper. And the Grim Reaper himself comes into play at some point and kind of tells them, like, stop fucking with the bodies. That's my job. <laughs> you know, almost like saying, stop killing people. I'm supposed to kill people. And but that doesn't come to play again after. So I, I was so confused by the end. And I was really paying attention this time because I remembered I listened to the episode before uh, from, you know, seven years ago or six years ago. And we were confused back then. And I thought, okay, I'm really going to try to figure this out this time so we can kind of do something different. And by the end, I'm like, I don't fucking know what happened. <laughs> like, and maybe they're in purgatory, which is what I said six years ago. Uh, maybe not. Who knows? They they, they show a like a, uh, a snow globe at some point, you know, at the beginning of the movie. That's how the movie starts. And at the end, they kind of show that they're in that snow globe. It's, it's a weird movie. <laughs> yeah, then... So... They decide, him and uh, Francis and Najee decide to just fucking fuck off and leave, right? So they're driving, and then they suddenly get stopped at a, a bridge that doesn't exist anymore. So they turn back. But right before that, Najee, who, who doesn't verbalize anything the whole movie except doing noises, speaks a whole sentence like he's been, and I hate to use this word, but normal, right? And, like, so is it in Francis's head? Is it from Najee's perspective? Is it a fucking dream? Did everything happen as it seems or, you know, like what, like, what is, what is the answer? Is there an answer? What, what does Nagi say at the end? Cause maybe that is the key. He, he I can't remember what he says. Something like, can you please take me home now? And they go okay. back to the cemetery. I mean, maybe there's some, I don't know. It's, to, this movie the ending is so bizarre right like it, it, it becomes very obviously i mean the whole the whole i would say last third of this movie becomes extremely dream sequency where a lot of it doesn't 
stop it stops making sense right where the detective knows that he's killing them pretty much he's like no you didn't do it like it's someone else or whatever you know and we get to you know the doctor you know injecting his penis and uh, and just a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense culminating to yeah this final scene where the road doesn't exist anymore basically they're stuck in this city town with the cemetery and it ends with the snow globe they're stuck inside this snow globe so i don't know i don't know what the fuck it means <laughs> you know i really don't like i have no inkling of what we're supposed to believe here whether it be is this uh one massive dream sequence is like this sort of like that tv show where everything was inside this that kid's head um you know in the living inside the snow globe i don't know you know i i don't fucking know i have no clue yeah it's it, and did he kill everyone in town like there's a shot of everyone dead at the uh kind of the, the place that he goes to like when he goes downtown so I, yeah I, I totally lost kind of the plot about three quarters in and i just have no idea what they were thinking and it's it's yeah it's a weird movie it's too bad because i think had they somehow brought it all together it would have been a much higher score for me but it should they just leave it on such a weird note that i'm just like okay yeah you know and i, I think purgatory like you said might be it or his hell or yeah. i don't know what he would have done to it deserved it because he's a pretty good guy right, right. for all until he's he snaps if that's real he snaps i mean that is the whole other thing too right like maybe it's just he snapped like right and it's Mm -hmm. kind of all in his head sort of like uh american psycho right like how it was really all in his head at the end (laughs) you know it's weird though actually do anything that's a good point um but i think it's played for laughs but it might have something to do with the ending where whenever francis is talking to naji he Francis responds like he's getting responses back from him, like coherent thoughts, coherent sentences. So like it's played for laughs, like he's just talking to himself from our perspective. But once we see him in the end where he actually speaks full sentences that make sense with no hint of any disability, like could that be a hint at it's in I don't know where I'm going with it anymore, but <laughs> like I don't I wish Maybe. I should I should have watched it with the commentary on. Maybe they said something. Right. So would you think I mean, this is another theory, but do you think like one is real and one isn't, right? So maybe like really Nagi is the actual character that's doing this the whole movie and not the other, uh, I'm sorry, the other character, Cemetery Man? Or is it Cemetery Man that is the real character and he's like, you know, and Nagi is sort of in his conscious conscience. What do you guys think? Uh, I I think based on what we know, and and I also think that this is an unreliable narrator where we don't see what, what is factual at all times. I think there's probably some, the message is probably there. Like we just, it wasn't conveyed correctly or we're just missing it. But I think, I don't know what I think. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Because then I think of something else. I'm like, wait, that just knocks that out of the park. I think it was all what we saw. It, it's taken at face value, except that Naji is more coherent than we think and he's i don't know <laughs> I, really, I, I don't know figment of fucking francis's imagination he's not really there i don't know yeah i don't know <laughs> right, you guys want to read it sure go ahead yeah so um like i said i you know despite you know kind of shitting on it for the last uh, 10 minutes i i do think there's a lot to love about the film as well a lot of cool imagery a lot of cool kills a lot of cool zombies i'm just more down on it than i was the last time i guess i knew a lot of the beats going in so it's not as exciting re-watching it as opposed to watching it for the first time so i gave it a three out of five yeah i i personally don't remember what i said about the movie originally or what i even rated it at the time but yeah, I mean, I think the first half of this movie is great. Like, I was having such a fun time watching it. I was like, this is like four out of five territory heading into it. And then the second half happens, and I feel like it just it just goes too off the rails and gets too weird for me that it becomes less of an enjoyable experience. So, yeah, I'm the same as Steve, three out of five. You know, I actually had it at a four, but having talking about it, 
talked about it. I'm putting it at a three and a half because that last third act, that last act is really rough. Like they, if they would have kept it just straight with like some whimsical shit thrown in, sure, but just eliminated the dick part and all that completely, I think we would have had a better film. So three and a half out of five. All righty. And that leads us to our final movie of the night. My pick from 2015, and that is The Witch. A family in 1630s New England is torn apart by the forces of witchcraft, black magic, and possession. So we have a very highly religious Puritan family led by the father, William. The movie basically opens with him essentially getting into an argument with uh, their village Essentially, over he has a lot of uh, disagreements with them, basically, about how they're practicing religion. Uh, he is obviously an extremist on the religion, so he is basically banished. Him and his family is banished from the village, so basically they have to head and create their own livable you know, space uh, in the middle of nowhere, in the woods. While this is happening, a one of their children is taken into the wood by what is suspected as a witch and from there little by little worse and worse things start happening to this family is it actual witchcraft happening is it hysteria we find out as we go but i'll leave it at that for now yeah i mean i picked this movie because i mean in my opinion it is a modern horror masterpiece um i never will forget the first time i saw this movie in theaters I left with my jaw on the floor. I really, it is really a modern movie that I, it had no other horror movie has really affected me or blew me away like The Witch has in recent memory. This is like the first movie I like left, you know, in the past 20, 30 years that I just thought was just absolutely fantastic. So that's why I picked it. There's a lot more, obviously, we can get into and will get into, but take it away, guys. Steve, did, did I don't remember. Did you like this film before? I liked it. I didn't love it. I was like at a three out of five at uh, when I first watched it. All right, cool. Take it away. Yeah. So yeah. So it, it's uh, my second time watching it. I watched it the first time when it first came out on like Blu-ray or whatever it was, and uh, yeah, I, I thought it like. I thought it was good, but not great. It didn't grab me like anyway, like uh, it did with Joe. But this was also probably my first A24 film I've ever seen, at least to my recollection. And I wasn't really kind of used to the vibe of A24 like I am now, because I appreciate that studio a lot more now than I would have back then. And my opinion has changed quite a bit on this movie, having now rewatched it, I guess with a different mind than I had back then. I still think it's slow at times. Like there's times where I'm just like looking at my, you know, phone and just like, okay, we still got half an hour left in this, you know, but it is a slow burn by the letter. It starts off slow and it's just slowly progresses into something that's actually pretty crazy. There's some really like awesome scenes in this performances. Fantastic. The score from Mark Harvin, amazing. And there's a lot to love about it, you know? It's still not one of my favorite A24 films, but I definitely respect it and like it more now than I did back then. All right. I absolutely love this film. Uh, I agree with Joe that it's one of the best films of the last, I I think I put number one on my 2010s list, if I remember correctly. It's amazing. Um, I love the score, the acting, but I also love the feel of it. Right. And I understand it's the slow movie. I get that. And I can get why that can turn people off. But this movie has so much crammed into it. Subtle things like that is just fucking scary to me. And it shouldn't be because it's not like played for scares. For example, uh, the little kids, the twins saying like Black Phillip told us that's fucking scary, man. Like Black Phillip's talking to you and you look at this fucking goat and it's just a goat. It's a normal goat. But the way they shoot him makes him seem so fucking sinister. Right. And then the fact that. um uh, Anya Taylor Joy is playing Peekaboo with her little baby uh, brother, and then literally two seconds pass, less than that, and the child's missing. And just her reaction to that, and then looking into the forest. The forest is a character by itself, where it's just foreboding and dark and and mysterious and things like that. Anytime you add religion to a film like this, too, it automatically ups it because you have the the contrast of like if we believe in God and the Lord or whatever, we're gonna be fine. And they're combating 
the pure evil and us as the viewer like know what's happening we know there's a witch in there and we know what we need to do we need to fucking either kill that fucking witch or get the hell out of here but they don't know that right they're assuming that was a wolf and trying to keep everything calm and then the slow degrade of the family like the nucleus right the dad strong character but he can't provide for them and the demon or devil or witch, whatever you want to call it, is taking advantage of that by speaking through other characters saying like, well, you can't even fucking, all you can do is chop firewood. You know what I mean? And he has to deal with this. Like, you can't even feed our family. Um, the silver uh, cup that was the mom's that he traded to an Indian trader for some other stuff. Like, that's a big uh, device. And that's, he, she takes uh, she takes offense to that because he comments like, well, we left the, the church because they're drinking from silver chalices. And she's like, why you got to fucking bring that up? Where it's like, it's just subtle things that they bring up that don't really, from from a step back, if you're not paying attention, are kind of like throwaway lines. But if you're like watching the film, that you see it all connects and it's it's a really, really smart writing. Yeah, I mean, it blows me. I mean, this is a first time. This is a directorial debut too, right? Like, a, or a full length from Eggers. And my God, I mean, the attention to detail that he did with this movie is is really amazing if you kind of like look into the behind the scenes stuff i mean he insisted on only using tools from that time period to build the sets uh it was all practically built and shit i mean it's just fucking wild but it, it i mean i mean he to me it was it worked amazingly the whole movie has such a sinister tone to it throughout like there's just a sense of dread while watching it i think a lot of it just the color scheme of this movie it's so dark and dreary there's not i don't think one ounce of sunshine in the whole movie it's just all overcast cloud and darkness throughout and yeah like uh, todd said the woods just uh, are is really its own character but the movie is really highlighted by its score the score is so haunting so terrifying i did the interview seven years ago but from what i remember mark corvin literally created an instrument just for this movie if i if i remember correctly and it's it I, I can't remember the name of the instrument you'll probably hear it in the interview but holy shit like it's it's just fucking just such a haunting haunting score um i have it on vinyl i'll play it every once in a while and it, it really does feel like something is cursed when you're when you're listening to it at times between the chanting and just like it's very very witchy what also i found really interesting about this movie is is you could take out the witch aspect of this movie completely and it's still terrifying in a lot of ways. You can see how the witch hysteria started back, you know, in Salem in, in the 1600s. If there's not even a witch there, just the little kids accusing their sister of being a witch and pretending to be bewitched and stuff like that. Um, that almost, you know, the father literally almost, you know, sort of kills Thomas in a, at one point by locking her away and shit like that. So I think with you don't even need to insert an actual witch into this movie and it still shows just the hysteria of that time, which I, I think is amazing as well. And, but then you throw in the, the actual witch stuff. I mean, you literally have the witch, a very dark scene, but you literally see her bathing in the baby's blood at one point and it's very quick and very to the point, but it's it's disturbing as hell. And then you get an amazing scene when the brother, Mercy, I believe is his name. Caleb? Is, is it Caleb? Okay, the, Caleb. The, the older brother? Yeah, okay, yeah. Jonas and Mercy are the two younger ones. So yeah, when Caleb gets lost in the woods with Thomason, and then he, you know, she ends up found on her way back, but he is still lost in the woods, absolutely uh, vulnerable to the witch. And, you know, the witch showing her way, her sort of sexiness is... Which, you know, plays on you go back, you know, at one point you see Caleb looking at Thomason, his own sister, um, in a sexual way, you know. So the witch is playing off of the sins of this family or the of this highly religious family. And it knows, you know, it knows what what kind of makes this family tick in certain ways or their um, sinful ticks in a lot of ways. And the fact that Eggers uses all black, but then when Caleb sees this witch, he's in all red and the use of red in that scene really pops and it seems so welcoming. And then you get the, the terrifying witch hand 
that lays upon him to bewitch him. And I, I could just keep going on, but I'll, I'll let you guys take over. No, I, I love the scene too when Caleb essentially, and here's how I see the see the scene, and you guys let me know if it's different. But um, you know, Caleb wins. He he wins through faith, right? He is possessed or bewitched or whatever. He's like, I can feel her. I can feel her. He lies earlier in the film to his mother about he. Uh, of, of why they went out to the forest to hunt because the mom doesn't know how bad it is at that point so caleb's like covers for his dad saying like yeah i thought i saw an apple orchard i'm so sorry and then an apple once he's possessed or whatever comes out of his mouth but in my opinion like caleb his through his faith is able to win over her power although he dies from the effort which i thought was just a fucking really great scene because through the window too some finally we get a little bit of light coming in and that, that's how i read the scene anyway yeah, I mean, agreed. The witch uh, obviously bewitches him, but he does, through his faith, is able to go to what he sees or portrays as as the kingdom. You know, at the very end, he sees uh, God. So yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, Caleb does win tragically. <laughs> you know, he still he still gives up his own life, but he is able to escape the bowels of the witch um, through his faith. Which yeah, I mean, it's that scene really is so well done and just the tension in that scene with like i said the 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 kids pretending to be bewitched and you know that the the father i mean god ralph innocent by the way is just amazing in this movie his fucking voice is so perfect say no uh, boy yeah (laughs) he's he's so good in this movie you know you could really feel just how strong of a character he, he is, but literally he can't do anything. And just him being so vulnerable. Uh, and you can really feel towards the end, especially how vulnerable his character becomes. Which which is, it's a really good point that I think they, they put across in this film is that he's so pure of mind that he doesn't get like corrupted. He literally gets beaten to death by the demonic force, which I'm like, fuck, they couldn't get him. So they, literally beat his ass but like that scene before he's killed when they are locked in the the stable and then the hag witch comes in and is literally sucking the goat milk out it's fucking so fucking scary man yeah that cackle she lets out is is just is bone chilling it it really is and and once again like it's a movie where you don't need to show a lot right like they never show that the the mercy and jonas are, are killed in that barn but you know that's exactly what happened. You know what I mean? And it doesn't kill Thomason because this whole movie, it wants Thomason, right? Like this, this, the devil wants Thomason. He sees that she can be the one that can be corrupted into which, evil. Which she gives the plot away too when she's pretending that she's a witch. She's like, I'm going to dance right. with the devil, blah, blah, blah. And like she mm-hmm. literally gives the plot away. I'm like, dang, it's cool. Yeah, there's a lot of cool imagery in this you know just the horror imagery of I, I like the choice of showing the witch right at the beginning so there's no doubt that there is a witch like i but i agree with joe that it was needed you know it still would have been a good film but i i liked knowing that the witch was actually out there because it just gave a different element to the film you know it wasn't just a essentially a kind of a murder mystery like who's actually doing the killing you know who's why is the baby actually gone and stuff like that so i I like that a lot some of the stuff that happens you know you have the crow pecking at the mom's breast which is just like fucking disgusting you have black philip which is such a cool character and he has such a cheeky grin when they show like close-ups of black philip just like chilling Uh, i i really love that and yeah the it's really the the score and the aesthetic that really make this film, which is kind of how I felt about The Lighthouse as well. You know, it wasn't so much the story that grabbed me. It was the score and the aesthetic that really grabbed me. Although this one has a better story. Religious, you know, extremism in this case, like they're just so religious that they're willing to kill their own family members, essentially to, you know, appease God is is just crazy to me. But that's how some people are, you know, and it's interesting to see kind of that, uh, what they were like especially that at that time like you said it's kind of like around the salem witch trials and yeah you could totally see people believing people are witches just based off the series of events or shown in this movie yeah and you can see why thomason would easily go to the dark side so to speak too because throughout the whole film she's belittled and blamed for a lot of the stuff and at the end was like which is fucking chilling when she's trying to get blackfield to talk and then he does it's like what's he say like this out see a book or something like that you got the quote joe is it 
so yeah so basically what happens is is you know when she conjures black philip to speak he immediately starts tempting her you know he says would you like you know would you like to see the world would you like to would you like uh, the taste of butter a pretty dress you know tempting her with all of these things that, deliciously yeah and then he says would you like to live deliciously which obviously back then just the taste of butter you know was was an amazing thing and uh, you know the the simple pleasures in life that they didn't have back then so you can see why she was so easily manipulated to basically sign her life away to the devil yeah and it's super super cool scene when they're talking but even like really neat when she's walking through the forest like nude and then comes across a massive campfire of nude women and they all just start fucking rising in the air and i'm like holy it's it's visually just such a fucking cool scene it it really is and you can see her being very unsure up until she finally rises and then she's smiling you know from ear to ear and it's it's really chilling when you think about it i mean it's she gave in to pure evil and she's happy about it <laughs> you know yeah. it, it's pretty chilling when you really think about it yeah after she just killed her mother and her father and brothers and sisters were all murdered by this entity and she's like get my address well, in a, in a weird way, she's free for the first time. You know, she's been kind of a too. kind of a slave to the family for her whole life. They they treat her like the help, basically. You know, they they treat her so poorly. And yeah, she has good relationships with her brother, even though he's like perving on her, and you know, her father also as well. But he's still kind of blaming her. You know, pretty quickly. And yeah, I think she's this is like her freedom. So that's what tempted her to the, you know, the dark side. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. I think th that pretty much wraps it up, I think, nicely. So, sure. any final thoughts before we rate it? No. All right. I mean, you know where I'm going with this. Obviously, I, I, I love this movie. It was my number one movie, two of the decade when we reviewed it. And yeah, to me, it's a modern horror masterpiece. I give it a five out of five. 100% agree. Uh, I'm giving it a five out of five as well. I, I find it very hard to find anything I don't like about it. So, five out of five yeah so like i said i think i gave it a three out of five when i watched it uh, in 2016 17 whenever it came out but i'm at four and a half now you know i i'm more of an a24 guy than i was and i appreciate it more for kind of its deliberate pace and you know imagery and score and the whole package comes together really well the only thing that keeps it from a five is i do find it a little boring at times where i was just like okay this is let, let's get on to the next thing but i still really appreciate it. it's not one i would watch often either that that also plays a little bit into my score you know it's not like i'm eager to rewatch it i'll maybe watch it like 10 years from now or something but still eggers man is fantastic director and i'm I'm glad I got to rewatch it and kind of see it with a new perspective and like, um, yeah. And his nose, um, nose for Atu. I mean, God, he's going to be absolutely perfect for that role. And might I add for those of you who have seen it or have never seen it, highly recommend watching it with subtitles because oh, it I, is in I old English. That. Me too. Yeah, it I couldn't understand the dad yeah, too much. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it is of course in old English, which I think we even failed to mention in this review. So it's very authentic, but it is hard to pick up at times some of the old English. So I think watching it with subtitles on, um, you won't miss a beat. And it's a lot more, I think, enjoyable of an experience. And you pick up everything with the subtitles on. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to ask you guys just a couple, not not many uh, questions about the origin of the podcast. Just to kind of wrap up this episode and this tribute to the Three Guys Days. So first I want to know, how did the podcast first come together? Like, how did the conversation start, especially between you two? I know there was a third who's uh, not on the podcast anymore. It hasn't been for a long time. But between you two, like, how did it start? Where did the discussion come from? And where did you first, like, quote unquote, meet? Yeah. yeah. I, I, well, go take it, Todd, because this was all your idea to start from what I remember. Yeah. I mean, there's a, I, we can go very long with this but we all started on youtube you know making horror unboxing videos and you know ratings and reviews stuff like that so that's how we kind of you know quote unquote met 
Um, and then I, you know, I, I got really disenchanted with videos. And I think Joe did at the same time and Steve as well, which, you know, obviously Steve's in, um, came a little bit later after that, but I'm like, you know what, I've always wanted to do a podcast and I really liked Joe and the other gentleman at the time. And I think I just reached out to Joe first. I'm like, Hey, you like any interest in doing a podcast? And he was like, fuck yeah, absolutely. And then got with the other guy. And then I was in between moving at the time from California to Kentucky. And then once we got here, we just started shooting very, very loose. So, right. We didn't have any like plan and we did it like once every 70 days sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, there was, there was no structure like whatsoever. You know, we literally had no fucking clue what we were doing. Our audio quality was shit. Skype. Uh, you know, yeah, we went through Skype. It was, it was, uh, it was just three, you know, guys that were talking hard and just shooting the shit. But yeah, I mean, we learned obviously severe from our mistakes, you know, we started to realize, well, you know, you actually want to sound good probably when you record a podcast and, yeah. uh, you know, and you actually probably want to have some sort of structure and, you know, when you do interviews, you probably don't want to just wing it, which you'll hear on Mark, the Mark Corvin episode that's coming up. I, that was the first interview I ever did. I mean, I was nervous as hell, obviously. And I, yeah, I completely winged it. At one point I froze because I couldn't think of anything to ask. And I pretended like I had a phone call and I was like, Oh, I'll be right back. I'm sorry. There's a phone. I have a quick phone. <laughs> like, uh, so like I had to like compose myself for two minutes to try to figure because I was like completely froze. Um, I also did that interview in my underwear because like I had just woken up because I think he was like he wanted to do it at, like eight in the morning. And the funny part about that is, thank God, my camera was off because he was on camera. We did it through Skype. And I was like, oh, fuck. And I remember like ducking because like I thought maybe he saw me. <laughs> but, but thankfully he didn't. I mean, could you imagine like I'm fucking just sitting there like in my fucking underwear and he comes on? Um, just but chilling. <laughs> I'm just chilling there with my underwear. And I, I, had, like, I had like my cup of coffee and shit. I'm like, what the fuck? But I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it was, it was all good, right? Because it's, you, it's all learning, right? Like as is anything, you know, you, you have to fail first and and do a lot of fuck ups before you can start to you know you need to gain that experience so you know it was it's been a wild ride the, you know and we've gotten better clearly um since the beginning and and we're still improving all the time yeah those that have been with us since the beginning which steve is one of them and now he's he's a host we we definitely matured and that that is not a knock against the gentleman that was on here before we all me and Joe both part partook in stupid ass questions. Oh my god! Know? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I mean, we were younger then. I mean, granted, we were only like seven, eight years younger then. But yeah, I mean, I was, I was immature mm -hmm. and didn't get. You know, I was also, you know, drinking every episode yeah, too. Like we, we were getting drunk. We were getting drunk every episode. You know, I, you know, now we do these stone cold sober, and it shows. You know, we're a lot more professional, and you know, it's it's definitely for the best. <laughs> I remember I um got so drunk that i edited the episode and i left i i had repeating shit in there like i left it in i'm like eh, fuck it who cares <laughs> but yeah we used to ask people um actors like big like when a quigley was on we used it that was a really good like stacked lineup but we would ask them like inappropriate uh, we, questions yeah, yeah. Well, we can we can <laughs> say what they were we used, we used to ask you know what horror movie have you pleasured yourself to and things like that right Which, thinking back at it is like super cringy and I, I feel embarrassed for myself extremely yeah but it's embarrassing to think about but honestly most of them i feel like i there was only like maybe one or two awkward um yeah. responses we, we, to that we also i feel did like, it if we read it right yeah right there were a couple times i remember where we were like we should not ask this question. You know, yeah. I remember us private messaging. So I think we we were kind of smart in that way. We were like, okay, I think we can get away with asking mm -hmm. <laughs> this question at the time. But I always used to dread it, honestly. Like, especially, you know, the more and more we would do it. But we did get the occasional really fun answer with that. You know, Linnea was very forthcoming about that, actually, <laughs> I, from what I remember. And she loved it, you know. But yeah, yeah I mean, obviously, that was way before you know, other things, it's very inappropriate now looking back on it. And I'm, I'm glad we got away from all that. It, it's a completely different show, re regardless yeah, of the third host. It it's completely different. Like if we threw Steve into the role that is vac was vacant, it would still be a completely different show because it was just, it was bad. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't, and I'm not like saying, I, I just think if we continued on on that platform, 
I don't think we would still be a podcast today. You know no, what I mean? I think we that. probably would have, I think me and Todd at times talked about calling it quits, honestly, and, and we just never did. And then, you know, finally we went through our transition and I think that it did breathe a lot of fresh air and life uh, into this podcast I, I, for the better. Yeah, I agree. And I think you and I, and I, this might be boring to people that don't give a shit, but I think you and I also gave in a little bit to not peer pressure, but a kind of pressure to perform in a way that wasn't us either. You know, like sure. this yeah. the, on on this show tonight, even like this is more how we are. Rec- at least I am. You guys too. Like it's pretty much every day, like how I am, you know, talking about horror movies, but like with the other show it was like, all right, I got to be a little bit different character. You know what I mean? We had to like sure. be raunchy and shit, which is not how I am every day. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah, we were going for sort of the shock jock style <laughs> podcast Stern. back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think at one point that was touted as uh, you know, oh the hard the hard stern of horror podcasts. And yes. I agree. It wasn't it wasn't us, you know, and uh, I'm glad we decided to it, it took something you know, really bad happening for us to like, all right, we gotta we gotta Yeah, it you this. know, we it, things started becoming a little awkward and, you know, we, we just weren't meshing together anymore. And I, you know, I think we started to realize that the more and more, I mean, we did 70, what, three episodes together. And we, we finally realized, you know, this isn't what we want to do anymore. So we had to make a decision. Either we stop podcasting altogether or we have to make a change. And you know, me and Todd are very non-confrontational. Obviously, we're very easygoing, but we finally decided, listen, we we have to make a, a change and we have to do something different. And honestly, I was scared. You know, I was like, this is probably this could either be really good. This uh, this could be a good thing or this could be really bad and blow up in our faces. And this will be the end of the podcast, you know, mm-hmm. and thankfully it was for the best. And st- you know, we, after that, you know, we brought Steven and we finally came up, we finally found our voice in a lot of ways where we were able to come up with a good structure. And with that, all good things happen. Like finally we started getting legit studios reaching out to us, asking us to review their movies and asking us to interview celebrities and whatnot. And it, it, yeah. And our numbers started looking better and yeah, I mean, like I said, when that changed, I thought, oh, well, no one's going to listen anymore, but it was quite the opposite. So uh, it, in the end, it all worked out for the best. And here we are now, you know, Steve being, what, 150, 200 episodes in now with oh, us yeah. or something oh, like yeah, that? I'm, a, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm over 200 now, like yeah. two, 225-ish. Yeah. Right. So, and here block. we are. Yeah. yeah, it's been crazy. And, you know, things have mainly stayed the same obviously we did lose sam what a year and a half ago now two years ago and that was a blow to us too it was but that was a different situation for the reason we left right yeah yeah. she left on her own accord yeah Yeah. she left on her own accord she had a lot going on we obviously Mm -hmm. still miss her to this day and we understand why she left but yeah i mean things have progressed and you know we're still going strong and yeah i mean things are just we have so many things in the works, whether it be events or, uh, you know, other things. I mean, we, I mean, we do this honestly, like for us, you know, but also the listeners, like, I think, you know, this is an escape for all of us to just talk horror for a couple hours every week, but it's a lot of work, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, a, a lot. I mean, Steve spends hours and hours editing and, you know, us planning events and whatnot. I mean, I, October was one of the most chaotic months of my entire life, but I, I wouldn't change it, honestly. Like being able to talk horror with both of you guys and it's it's amazing. And being able to talk, to, you know, like, to horror directors, writers, celebrities, it's been, I never thought, you know, looking back at, you know, me in high school, you know, just being just a massive horror fan and being now being able to do this, you know, it's still a hobby. Obviously we don't make money off of this or anything like that, but just being able to do events with horror celebrities and, and it's really just, it's really cool what we've kind of built over these 300 episodes. And I, I never, would have imagined some of the opportunities that we've gotten just from doing this podcast. It's really, really cool. 
uh, with all that though, I just don't want people to think that this is like the end here. <laughs> you know, we're like, it, it seems almost like we're like, you know, a send off. You, know? you can be honest with them. This is our last episode. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but I was yeah. telling Joe that in a lot of ways, I feel like this episode 303 is like a season finale, you know, because I feel that starting next episode, we're going to start changing a little bit in a lot of ways. Like we're thinking, to be honest, pretty fucking big <laughs> like we're thinking outside the box on a lot of different things like i, I don't want to excited yeah it, it, we're we're like you know i don't know it, it's like we're starting to feel that okay maybe we have something here that's more than just a podcast in a way and you know there's going to be some changes some announcements and it's it's crazy the kind of stuff that's going to happen over the next year and plus and just yeah i can't wait to discuss some of it and in time yeah so. it, it is it is wild one final note on the three guys thing unless you had more questions steve but to think like i don't even remember what i said about a movie because i was wasted to being able to host an event which you know i didn't make the last one but the one i went to like being on stage in front of a sold out crowd just asking someone questions it was fucking amazing and wild and you know when i got into horror and I, I used to seek these people out you know via forums like oh who's this fucking guy like oh, he's cool he likes fucking zombies like me like <laughs> you know it's just it's just it's just nothing i'm really excited for the future honestly like um i think we all get burned out with anything whether it's a hobby or work or whatever but i think the the next steps are going to be pretty fucking exciting and i think you guys listening will like it too hopefully yeah absolutely yeah there's there's gonna be some changes you know like i said it's kind of like a season finale but next season is gonna be fucking wild i can tell you that with all the stuff we got planned and it's it's gonna be cool you know and i'm i'm glad that we had this kind of i think final look back at the three guys days in fact this is the first time i think i don't that any of the audio from those days is being re-released in any form so with the intro at this episode, which you all heard, the interview with Mark Corvin, which is, you know, I'm the only one I think that has the old episode, like buried somewhere and stay tuned till after the, um, the end credit, like song, I have a little like tribute to the three guys days, just the first time the three of us got introduced on the podcast. So Joe and Todd, obviously episode one. And then myself on episode 11. It's just interesting to see how different our lives are from back then. So, yeah. And stay tuned for the future episodes. Yeah, absolutely. The future hopefully looks bright for us. We have a lot of exciting things planned over the next 300 more episodes. We're going to keep going. Obviously, we're excited. We're excited to see where our future holds. But honestly, without you guys, our listeners, we would not still be doing this. So just a huge thank you, obviously, to our listeners, to our amazing Discord community, just all of you guys. Without you guys, yeah, I mean, we would have quit a long time ago. You know, if no one listens, we'd just be the three of us talking. So we appreciate you guys, of course, for tuning in every week for messaging us, for talking to us on Discord, for coming up and introducing yourselves when you've seen us in person and stuff. I mean, it's really cool um, to know that, you know, we have brought some sort of joy into your lives just by talking some horror movies and whatnot. And we're excited to dis- for you guys to uh, see what we have in the future for all of you. We really appreciate you. So that is going to be it for this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed our little look back on 300 episodes and what it was like before the horror squad podcast days. I think now after 300 episodes, we can officially put that chapter to bed and move on to bigger and brighter things now. So yeah, in the meantime, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram threads, just search the horror squad podcast. You of course can email us anytime the horror squad podcast at gmail.com. But of course, as you already know, the absolute best way to keep up with the podcast is our discord. Just send us a DM through any of our socials or send us an email and we will get you a link to join our discord. Amazing community over there. Movie clubs, every single month talking about events of course that are upcoming we actually just teased something for next october exclusively on our discord so go and check that out if you haven't already seen it 
but yeah, I think that uh, pretty much wraps it up. Uh, merch, tpublic.com, if you'd like to support the podcast that way. And uh, we got some other exciting things coming up. Next week, we are going to be reviewing Silver Bullet with a fourth person on the mic for that episode. You'll have to wait and see. We are going to have a special guest for that episode. So there's a little another tease for you. So stick around for that. But that is going to be it. But don't forget, stick around for uh, our seven-year-old interview with Mark Corvin, the composer of The Witch. I'm kind of dreading re-listening to that, but I think I have to. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Don't forget, also stick around for the special bumper at the end of the episode after the outro and we once again we thank you so much for listening to us for 300 plus episodes now and we hope you stick around with us for the next 300 we'll see you guys next week bye 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 hey guys welcome to back to three guys that horror we're going on um, just uh, solo tonight. Todd could, unfortunately couldn't jo- uh, join me for this interview but uh, I'm here with a very special guest uh, Mark Corvin uh, Mark you guys will probably know him best for composing The Witch and Cube. Very talented guy. But, uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Just struggling with a bit of a cold, but aside from that, okay. All right. Uh, Mark, you want to just kind of give yourself a little intro, uh, you know, where people can find you, stuff like that? Where people can find me? Well, I guess, uh, you know, I, there's some stuff on on iTunes, and there's also stuff on, on YouTube. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called Indie Filmmaker where I uh, upload a, a whole bunch of stuff. I have a, um, a video on Indie Filmmaker right now that's doing really well. Uh, it's on uh, an instrument that was created for me called the Apprehension Engine, which is getting a lot of, a lot of interest. All right. Very, very cool. So obviously The Witch, which just came out recently, has Obviously, been doing really, really well. How, how did uh, you go about uh, getting involved in that project? Well, it was um, it was rather a, a fluke. Uh, pardon me for the construction going on outside. I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, it's like a dental drill in my <laughs> ear right now. Um, uh, it, it was actually kind of a kind of a, a fluke. It came through my my agent. And uh, my agent told me about this this film, and there was a bunch of other composers up for it. There was like 12 other composers. So he sent me the script, and I thought, okay, well, I don't like this idea of 12 other composers being up for the job, but I'll take a look at the script. And I read it, and I thought, oh, this is this is really cool. I, I love this. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it would be a commercial film at all because of the, the language of the film. Um, you know, it was fairly hard to understand uh, Middle English for, for most people. Right. But uh, I thought it was really cool. The, the vibe was great. But I thought, okay, it'll be a, an offbeat little film that no one will see. But I'd love to do it. And um, But then I got, and I, got, I got cold feet. I thought, you know, I really don't want to um, go after a film that has so many other composers involved. And my wife said, no, I think you'd be totally right for it. Go for it anyway. So I figured, uh, well, okay, I'll go for it. But I have to find a way of distinguishing myself from the other composers. So I have this instrument called uh, a Swedish nickel harpa, which is a medieval bowed instrument. It's sort of like um, it's sort of like a cross between uh, a fiddle and a typewriter. So it's a it's a it's a a violin or a viola that's uh, that's played with with keys on, in the left hand and you bow it with the right hand. But it, it's, it has a really creaky, scratchy sort of feel to it. And um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, uh, I'll send him a bunch of stuff about the, the Nickel Harpa. And uh, he got back to me and he said, you know, the Nickel Harpa is awesome. That's the voice of the film. Uh, I want you to do it. So, great. <laughs> the game. Yeah, uh, and that instrument obviously, you know, worked perfectly with the just whole eeriness of the movie. Have you, are you a fan of the horror genre? Um, I'm a fan of, um, I, I think, I think I am, although I'm, I'm more drawn, I'm more drawn to horror films that are, are first and foremost, very good stories, right? uh, which, which the witch is because there's a very good story underneath it. And it's a very complex multi-layered story, which, which is what I like. I'm not really into the, you know, the slash, uh, slasher, uh, gore 
genre at all. Right. But I like I love films like uh, Let the Right One In mm-hmm. or uh, Rosemary's Baby or The Shining, things like that. Real, real classic, good storytelling. That's what I love. Yeah, absolutely. So I got uh, a, a couple questions from um, a, uh, my buddies who couldn't join us for the podcast. My co <laughs> my co host Todd, he wants to know. Um, what what's your favorite score from like another film that like you haven't been involved with? My favorite score of all time would probably be the Shawshank Redemption. Oh yeah, by mm-hmm. Thomas Newman. Absolutely, that is a fantastic one for sure. His, he wanted to know when uh, you know for the with the witch. Did you play around with different types of music or like you know what we hear in the final cut is kind of what you had in mind the whole time? Um, no, it was it was um, it was a very unusual working experience. In that, Rob Eggers, the the director, had a very clear idea of the kind of music he wanted right from the very beginning. Because mm-hmm. that's just the kind of kind of guy he is. I mean, he he knew uh, he's the kind of guy that that he would make sure that that the buttons on the clothing were vintage buttons of of the time. Mm-hmm. And the 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 family settlement that that was built um, was made using the tools of the time. He was a, uh, a bit of a nut bar for authenticity. Yeah, <laughs> and he he prepared this film for five years, and he'd been listening to music. He li- he listens to music while he while he writes uh, scripts. So uh, he just he's the most prepared guy I've ever come across in my life. So he had a very, very good idea of, of the kind of music he was looking for. So a lot of it was reacting to the temp score that he temped in. And, uh, you know, most of it was great. And sometimes I would make suggestions like, you know, why don't we, why don't we bring in some singers here? Why don't we, why don't we make it uh, more of a choral thing here? Um, and, you know, why don't, we, um, why don't we use, you know, Nickel Harp as, as the basis for all this? Um, so I was able to, to, to sway it in a, in a certain direction, but, but I, I'd say largely the musical vision was, was his. Right. Um, so w- with this movie, um, were you able, like, so you said you read the script and then just based off the script, you, you just started writing the music. Is that how it uh, went? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I, uh, I wrote the music based on the, on the completed film. On the completed film. Okay. That's awesome. Um, one more question from Todd here. He just um, so after you know you're done composing and all that, do you go back and and watch the movies, or do you just kind of like leave it at that? Um, you, you mean once I once I finish scoring and I've I've said goodbye to everyone and I yeah. finish the film, do mm-hmm. I ever go back? Yeah, and like rewatch the films. Um, almost never. <laughs> almost never. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I guess I guess it's because you know when you're when you're a composer and you're working on the film, you, you, mm-hmm. you watch the film just countless times, and no matter what the film is, you're sick to death of it <laughs> at the end of the process. Yeah, I can understand that for sure. Uh, are you familiar with our Richard Band? Um, no. Okay, he's um he's a composer for uh the Full Moon movies. He's kind of wanted to know your thoughts on him, but if you're not familiar with him. Um, we'll we'll move on to another question. Um, I have some uh, fan questions here from some of the pe- uh, people oh, who. Oh, well, actually, oh, actually, can you tell me a little bit more about him? I, I actually think his name might have come out come up the other day. Uh, about Richard Mann? Yeah, he Full Moon Entertainment is kind of um, I guess you could say like a they do like a lot of B horror movies and whatnot, such as uh, Puppet Master and uh, series like those, but. Uh, He's just in the horror genre. He's just kind of, uh, you know, known kind of like, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Goblin. Yeah. 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 All right. So like it, it's uh, I wouldn't say similar to that, but just another kind of iconic horror uh, composer. But yeah, if you're not familiar with him, I uh, definitely recommend checking him out. Cool. Cool. Actually, the, the fellow I was thinking of, uh, someone just sent me a link yesterday to um, what she called not a great well, like an okay film mm-hmm. called A Dark Song, score by Ray Harmon. Okay. And and I was listening to this score, and man, the, the score is like, it's completely awesome. Oh, really? And definitely in keeping with, um, you know, the kind of mindset 
that that I'm into, which is more the minimalist mm-hmm. sort of thing. But uh, but if if you get a chance to check it out, it's it's a, a dark song and scored by Ray Harman, H A R M A N, and it's just awesome. All right, uh, yeah, awesome. I'll definitely check that out. So when you were composing, um, you know, obviously any of your music, uh, what, what would you say inspires you? Is it just, you know, the film itself or you were inspired, are you inspired by other works? Uh, no, it, it was, well, influenced, of course, by, by Robert's uh, temp score. Right. And, and what he was looking for. Uh, most, most of it was, uh, you know, things like Pin, Pindarecki or, or period music of, of the time. Um, so that's, that's what we are sort of drawing from. Um, we're, we're deliberately staying away from any kind of genre scores at all because Robert had no interest in that. Right. Cause, uh, like he's really not, not a horror, um, director. He doesn't think of himself as, as that at all. Right. Uh, it, but it just, you know, this film just sort of took him in a horror direction. So that's, that's where he went. But, um, like I said, he, he wasn't interested in, in genre music, in genre music at all. So I, deliberately stayed away from listening to anything else like that right uh how about in uh your other works any inspirations um from other from other composers sure oh uh well you know i i, I check out most of most of the the typical mainstream horror films that are that are out these days i i, I go see most of them because mm-hmm. since i since i've turned into uh because of the witch, I've sort of turned into the horror guy now. <laughs> nice. So, so you know, I think it's it's very important to sort of keep up with what other other composers are, are doing. So, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm pretty familiar with, with what's going on these days. Do you have a, a, a favorite that's come out recently, musically wise? Um, a fa- well, nothing, nothing that um, I mean, things I like. Sure. Nothing that, you know, knocks me out like, you know, the Shawshank Redemption or anything like that. Right. But certainly things that I, I enjoyed, like, uh, you know, I enjoyed um, um, uh, the score for Lights Out. Um, I enjoyed the score for, um, ooh, like, sorry, I can't, uh, the, the, name is, the name escapes me. Um, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. for all of them. How about It Follows? Did you uh, hear that? Yeah, yes, I did, uh, and I enjoyed the score for that a lot. I, I had an odd reaction to it because I remember when I when I first started listening to it, I thought, "Oh God, this is awful," <laughs> because it had that that seventies synth thing. Yeah, uh, which um, you know, since I grew up in the seventies, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm really familiar with the the whole synth uh, synth sort of score sort of thing, and and it was like left behind. You know, ten and ten or twenty years later, and it became really old hat and really sort of awful and electronic and boring. Uh, you know, I, I sort of had a knee react, a knee jerk reaction to it, like, oh my god, it's just like terrible seventies synth stuff. Right. Uh, but then, then the more I listened to it, the more I realized that it, how cool it was, uh, and, and I really like it, and, and it certainly turned into uh, being something that's very influential as well some a personal more personal stuff uh what what type of music uh do you enjoy are, are you into like the classical music or is there a type of music that you gravitate towards uh well i listen to um uh a lot of sort of left of center pop music like i i love i love indie pop mm-hmm. um and um i don't know i it, it's hard to say i listen to basically Anything I, anything I think is good. A, a lot of minimalist stuff. Yeah. Um, I like, I like, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, what what we would call twentieth century music. Yep. Um, uh, you know, things like Stravinsky and things like that that, that I love. Um, so yeah, just it's, I, I'm not into like one thing really. I, I'm, I, I guess I would say I'm more into into films these days than I am into music. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I, I definitely hear you on that. I, I can listen to pretty much anything myself. So do you have any uh, other uh, pr- projects cur- you're currently working on or anything uh, we can look forward to coming up? Um, let's see. Well, I'm, I'm working on a film right now called uh, called The Wanting, which, I, which I'm really enjoying. A uh, horror film, of course. Nice. <laughs> and the, the film that I was working on before that 
um, uh, another horror film called The House, uh, House. No, sorry, Our House. And a film, another horror film I was working on before that called, um, oh, they changed the name. I think it's called Chasing the Zodiac. It's like about the Zodiac killer. Okay, yep. Um, so, yeah, it, it seems to be a stream of horror films. And I have a couple of couple other horror films coming up in the, in the new year as well. Oh, that's, well, that's great. We would definitely look forward uh, to hearing all that. I mean, because The Witch, I mean, me personally, it was just an amazing soundtrack. And I, I think with, you know, that music is really what set the movie apart for me personally. You know, I think it really, uh, was, it almost was its own character in the movie. And, yeah. uh, and it was, no. oh, sure. And it was just, you know, it just made the atmosphere even more creepy. So, uh, you know, I just thought it was genius. Well, thanks, thanks. Uh, no, it's interesting what you say about uh, the music being a character because I really didn't get that when I was working on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I saw the completed film, um, just, like just after it was done, we had a like a private screening, just a playback right. uh, of the mix, and I realized that yeah, the, the the score is taking the character of the witch because we hardly ever see the witch right. in the entire film, but. But the music is really this this ominous presence, sort of off screen, of 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 her of the witch. Oh yeah, to- totally. I yeah, totally agree with that. How how did you feel about the completed film? Did you did you like it? Oh yeah, no, I, th- yeah. I thought it was I thought it was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm totally a fan of uh, of the witch, and uh, I'm a big a big supporter of. Um, uh, of Robert Eggers. Oh, definitely. I yeah, I'm very excited to see what uh, you know he's going to be doing next and whatnot. I, I personally, I know you said he's not he doesn't consider himself a horror director, but I'd love to see. I mean, what he would could do with uh, more horror movies. For well, sure. Well, he's he's actually he's actually working right now on. Um, uh, I think he's finished the script for uh, a remake of Nosferatu. Okay, yeah, you know now that you mentioned that, I do remember reading something about that. Yeah, and um, it looks it looks fairly good. It's not it's not written in stone, but it looks fairly good that I'll be involved with that, which oh, I'm real excited about. That's very exciting. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You, I, I, you know, based on you know what I heard in the witch, you you definitely would be perfect for that. <laughs> no doubt yeah, about it. Yeah, and and we have um, he's he's only done one other, one other feature, which is the witch. So this would be number two. Yep. Uh, um, so I'm hoping I can join up with him on on this and sort of be ca- be part of his regular team because uh, you know he's he's just a, he's a great storyteller director and a, and a wonderful human being too. So we get along very well. Awesome. Um, I think that's uh, all the questions we have, Mark. But I just really uh, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to sit down with me. Um, I know the other guys really appreciate it as well. I wish they could have made it. But maybe we can talk to you again in the future. Uh, very excited about all the upcoming projects you talked about. So can't wait to uh, hear uh, more of your stuff. Um, but uh, do you just want to, uh, once again, just kind of tell people where they can find you online and anything else you'd like to promote? Uh, well, let's see. Like, like I said, you know, you can go to iTunes um, and get the store, score for The Witch. Well, it's also on vinyl. From uh, Milan Records. And, yeah, and, I, I actually just picked that up uh, a couple weeks ago. The vinyl. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's amazing. Cool, cool. Yeah, they, actually, the record the records do, been doing fairly well. Yeah, uh, it's, it's like I I've been involved with record deals before, mm-hmm. and this is the first time I've actually seen royalty checks come in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty that's pretty thrilling. Uh, as well, they can go to my YouTube channel, uh, Indie Filmmaker. And there's, there's some things about the witch uh, on, on the channel as well. All right. Very awesome. Uh, so that is it, guys. Once again, a huge thanks um, to Mark for joining us. And uh, we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Thanks.
All right, hey everybody out there. So we are starting this podcast. We're calling it Three Guys at Horror. If you guys can guess what reference that's from, you'll get a freaking gold star. All right, uh, hey guys. Uh, what's up? My name is Joe Manganaro. You guys might know me from uh, Joe Manganaro's House of Horror on YouTube. Um, I'm residing currently right outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Tonight, I'm drinking rum and coke. That's usually my go-to drink uh, for any time I'm watching horror for the most part. But I'm also an avid beer drinker as well. An avid drinker in general, I would say. Um, but, uh, yeah, so what, you know, got me into the horror genre or movie in general? For me, it was Child's Play because that was the first movie, horror movie I ever watched. Uh, I was probably around six or seven years old. Uh, it was shown to me by shown to me by my mother. She, my mother was an avid horror fan as well. Yeah, um, nice. She kind of, you know, she got me into the genre pretty much. She would show me horror movies at a pretty young age, and she was very lenient, you know, um, on what I watched and what I didn't. Uh, you know, every time we went to the video store, I would head right to that, you know, horror VHS section and just pick uh, out a different, different horror movie every single time. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I would say Child's Play got me in, you know, that's what, you know, got me into my love of the genre, but also, you know, my mother as well, um, just cause she was such a big horror fan. All right. So my name's, uh, Todd Connett. I am originally from California, but now I'm in Union, Kentucky. Um, right now I'm drinking a beer. I wanted to go get some whiskey, but it didn't work out. And, uh, I guess my... F- the, the horror film that got me into it is also my favorite horror film to this day is Dawn of the Dead. Um, George Romero's, obviously. And I didn't become a horror fan. Like, you guys all started a lot younger than I did. I didn't see Dawn of the Dead until I was like, maybe like a freshman, like like around 15. Wow, dude. Yeah, and like an old VHS tape. Like but, it. like, that made me, like, want to track down, like, every single zombie film. But before that, it would be, like, Exorcist on VHS. It, like, scared the shit out of me. Yeah, like when you would walk by, um, like your parents or whatever, I don't know if you guys have older siblings, but they'd be like watching shit with their friends in the living room and you'd like sneak by and get like a drink of water or something, just like poke your head <laughs> in there. Um, so Steve, why don't you just go ahead and tell us about, you know, what you're doing on social media and YouTube and all that stuff. Hey, what's up nerds? Uh, YouTube basically, I, um, I, I'm known mostly for unboxing videos. Uh, I also have a weekly show where I talk about different, uh, geek subjects, not necessarily just related to horror. Uh, horror is, like, my favorite, probably, geek thing, so I talk about it a lot, but I do venture into other things. And uh, this year, because I'm kind of cutting back on the unboxings, I, I haven't felt that they've been very good lately, uh, for the most part, so I'm going to do a bunch of giveaways, and I'm going to try some new videos for my channel, just uh, different types of things, and... Uh, yeah, show off some collections I have that I've never shown off. Um, maybe do a short film. I mean, I studied film in college, so try to use that for something, and that's about it. Uh, and uh, my second question is, um, how did you get into the genre? Were you introduced by someone else, or did you stumble upon it uh, yourself? Oh, yeah, this uh, it's totally my dad. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, when my mom was is a nurse, and she used to work nights, and every time she'd work nights, it'd be like, okay, let's put on a horror film and watch that. So that's how I got into it. I mean, I remember the first time we did it, we watched Tom Savini's Night of the Living Dead. And it just absolutely scared the shit out of me. And I was fascinated by it. Uh, then it you know, it went on to Dawn of the Dead. And then it'd get to the point where I'd go to the old video stores and look at those awesome VHS covers and pick out of them. And just he introduced me to the genre. And I just... Loved it. Then I kind of got away from it, and it's in college I started really picking it up again because horror films are the easiest one to film when you're in film school. Uh, it's hard to do any other genre, I find, uh, for short films, like drama or comedy. So I, to get uh, better ideas of what to make as horror films, I started watching horror films again, and I haven't let up since. Oh, these guys are freaks.